pagi pagi untuk semuanya. Oke, baik. Ibu Dekan, monitor, Ibu Dekan. Selamat pagi, Pak Rektor. Alhamdulillah, terima kasih. Sama-sama, Bu. Baik, kita mulai saja, Ibu. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya, silakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Puji syukur, marilah kita panjatkan karyat Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Tuhan yang Maha Esa, karena atas berkat rahmatnya dan karunia-Nya, kita masih diberi kesempatan untuk mengikuti kegiatan seminar ini, meski hanya secara daring. Yang terhormat, Rektor Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, Bapak Profesor Dr. M. Solehuddin MPDMA, Wakil Rektor Bidang Pendidikan dan Kemahasiswaan, Bapak Profesor Dr. Didi Sukyadi MA, Wakil Rektor Bidang Riset Internasional Kerjasama dan Usaha, Bapak Profesor Dr. Adang Suherman MA, Dekan Fakultas Pendidikan Bahasa dan Sastra, Ibu Profesor Dr. Tri Indri Hardini MBD, para Wakil Dekan Fakultas Pendidikan Bahasa dan Sastra, para pembicara kunci dan pembicara undangan, para guru besar, pimpinan departemen dan prodi di lingkungan Fakultas Pendidikan Bahasa dan Sastra, para tamu undangan, para pemakalah, serta hadirin semua yang kami hormati. Selamat datang di Seminar Internasional Bahasa, Sastra, Budaya, dan Pendidikan kelima tahun 2021. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, let's begin our program. The Honorable Rector of Indonesia University of Education, Professor Dr. M. Solehuddin MPDMA, Vice Rector for Student and Academic Affairs, Professor Dr. Didi Sukiya DMA, Vice Rector for Research, International Affairs, Partnership, and Business, Professor Dr. Adam Suherman MA, the Dean of the Faculty of Language and Literature Education, Professor Dr. Tri Indri Hardini MPD, the Vice Deans of Faculty of Language and Literature Education, the keynote speakers, the featured speakers, the faculty professors, the head of department and study programs, the secretary of department and study programs, distinguished guests, presenters, and participants. We would like to welcome you all to the fifth International Conference on Language, Literature, Culture, and Education 2021. Sebelum kita mulai seluruh rangkaian acara seminar pada hari ini, marilah kita mendengarkan lagu Kebangsaan Indonesia Raya. Hadirin dimohon duduk dengan sikap tegak. Before we start the agenda, we would like to kindly invite all participants to listen attentively to Indonesian National Anthem Indonesia Raya. Dr. Udi dan kawan-kawan. Selamat datang, Prof. Masuki agenda acara yang pertama, kami mengundang Ibu Profesor Dr. Dr. Tri Indri Hardini MPD, Dekan Fakultas Pendidikan Bahasa dan Sastra untuk memberikan sambutan. 
As the first item of the agenda, we would like to call upon the Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Language and Literature Education, Professor Dr. Tri Indri Hardini MPD, to deliver her welcoming speech. Terima kasih. Ada burung di atas dahan, dahannya ada di pohon beringin. Saya ucapkan salam pembukaan kepada semua para hadirin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang saya hormati, Rektor Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, Bapak Profesor Dr. M. Solihudin, MPDMA. Yang saya hormati, para wakil rektor, wakil dekan FBS, para guru besar dan dosen di lingkungan FBS UTI. Yang saya banggakan, Ibu Profesor Dr. Nenden Sri Lengkanawati MPD dan Bapak Profesor Douglas K. Hartman yang menjadi pembicara kunci pada seminar internasional kali ini, serta hadirin semua yang tidak dapat saya sebutkan satu persatu. Puji syukur, marilah kita panjatkan kehadirat Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, Tuhan Yang Maha Esa, atas limpahan rahmat dan karunanya, kita masih diberi kesehatan dan kekuatan untuk mengikuti kegiatan pada hari ini. Hadirin yang saya muliakan, Saat ini Ecolite telah memasuki seri yang kelima, sebuah agenda rutin yang diselenggarakan oleh VBS setiap tahun. Dan sebelumnya, sebelum bernama Ecolite, kegiatan ini dinamai Forum Ilmiah yang diprakarsai oleh dekan saat itu, yaitu Ibu Profesor Dr. Nenden Sri Lengkanawati MPD. Dan salah satu tujuan dari kegiatan ini adalah mengenalkan para doktor baru di lingkungan FBS UPI. Kegiatan ini diharapkan dapat memberikan ruang bagi para doktor baru untuk menyampaikan pemikiran-pemikirannya atas hasil studi doktoral yang telah diselesaikannya. Hadirin yang saya hormati, pada tahun ini Ecolite memberikan panggung kehormatan bagi Ibu Profesor Dr. Nenden Silenkanawati MPD yang dalam beberapa waktu ke depan akan memasuki masa purna bakti. Beliau sempat menjadi dekan FBS selama dua periode dan beliau merupakan sosok yang memiliki kontribusi yang sangat besar dalam, dalam perjalanan FBS khususnya maupun UPI. Selain itu, beliau juga mencatatkan berbagai peran penting di kancah nasional maupun internasional. Dalam kegiatan ini, Ibu Profesor Dr. Nenden Sri Lengkanawati MPD akan menjadi pembicara kunci bersama-sama dengan Bapak Profesor Douglas K. Hartman dari Michigan State University. Terima kasih atas kesediaan Prof. Nenden dan Prof. Douglas K. Hartman atas dan selamat datang di Indonesia meskipun pelaksanaannya seminar ini dilaksanakan secara daring. Hadirin yang berbahagia, Ecolite yang kelima ini mengangkat tema Digital Literacy and Autonomy, Current Trends and Practices in Education, Culture and Literature Studies. Tema ini sejalan dengan kondisi saat ini, di mana peran digital di berbagai bidang begitu meningkat selama masa, masa pandemi dan tidak terkecuali dalam bidang pendidikan. Literasi digital dan otonomi pendidikan mampu maupun pembelajaran menjadi suatu pokok permasalahan yang sangat menarik untuk kita diskusikan. Berbagai kajian tentu banyak dilakukan oleh para ahli di bidang bahasa, sastra, dan budaya dalam menyikapi permasalahan tersebut. Dan forum ini diharapkan dapat menjadi ruang untuk mendisiminasikan berbagai hasil kajian yang telah dilakukan serta mendiskusikannya. Hadirin yang berbahagia, di penghujung sambutan ini saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada Rektor Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia beserta jajarannya yang telah mendukung terselenggaranya kegiatan ini. Dan mohon perkenannya kepada Pak Rektor untuk membuka acara ini secara resmi. Tak lupa saya ucapkan apresiasi yang luar biasa atas kerja keras panitia ekolat kelima dalam menyiapkan kegiatan ini dari awal sampai akhir. Terima kasih juga atas dukungan berbagai pihak atas penyelenggaraan ekolat kelima ini yang tidak dapat saya sebutkan satu persatu. Akhir kata, selamat melaksanakan seminar internasional. Semoga kita selalu mendapatkan keberkahan dalam setiap aktivitas kita. Dipintal kapas, dibungkus kertas, sampan berbaris, sekian melaju. Jaga fakultas, jaga universitas, di tangan kita FBS kan maju. Wabillahi taufiq wadayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik. Terima kasih kepada Ibu Dekan atas sambutannya. Selanjutnya, kami mengundang Bapak Profesor Dr. M. Solehuddin MPDMA untuk memberikan sambutan sekaligus membuka secara resmi kegiatan seminar hari ini. We would like to invite the Honorable Rector of Indonesia University of Education, Professor Dr. M. Solehuddin MPDMA, to deliver the opening speech and to officially open the conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in line with uh, our protocol regulation here, let me present my speech in Bahasa Indonesia. Yang saya hormati, Bapak-Bapak Wakil Rektor, 
Yang saya hormati Ibu Dekan FPBS serta para wakil dekan, yang saya hormati Bapak Ibu Ketua Departemen dan Program Studi dan secara khusus sama-sama ya, kita hormati Ibu Profesor Dr. Menden Sriyongkawati dan Bapak Profesor Douglas K. Head Hartman sebagai keynote speaker pada kesempatan ini. Dan juga kita sangat bangga ini dengan para uh, dokter muda ya masa depan Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia yang pada hari ini menjadi uh, para pembicara dalam kesempatan ini. Para hadirin semuanya, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <tuh> Puji syukur, marilah kita panjatkan kehadirat Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, Tuhan yang Maha. Karena pada hari ini kita masih diberi kesempatan dan kesehatan untuk melaksanakan seminar secara daring. Semoga kita senantiasa mendapatkan kekuatan serta kesabaran dalam menjalani masa pandemi COVID-19 yang ada pada saat ini. Hadirin yang saya muliakan, sebagai warga dunia dan warga negara, kita masih belum lepas dari pandemi COVID-19. Dunia dipaksa memasuki era baru dengan berbagai permasalahannya, tidak terkecuali bidang pendidikan. Dunia dipaksa memasuki, <tuh> dunia pendidikan mengalami perubahan paradigma yang begitu signifikan dalam satu tahun terakhir ini. Kondisi yang ada saat ini menghadirkan tantangan baru untuk ditaklukkan. Berbagai kajian dengan berbagai perspektif atas situasi pendidikan di masa pandemi ini perlu terus dilakukan. Hadirin yang saya banggakan, UPI terus mendorong para sipitas akademikanya untuk turut berkontribusi dalam memecahkan berbagai persoalan, khususnya di bidang pendidikan. Dengan mengusung semangat Merdeka Belajar, kampus Merdeka yang dicanangkan oleh Mendik Budrispek, UPI terus berbenah agar tetap selaras dengan tuntutan dan perkembangan zaman. Zaman dengan teknologinya yang semakin canggih. Pendidikan dan teknologi terus diselaraskan dengan kondisi dan kebutuhan di masa pandemi. Literasi digital dan otonomi pendidikan menjadi hal yang menarik untuk bisa didiskusikan saat ini. Hadirin yang berbahagia, saya berharap Ecolite kelima ini mampu menjadi ruang desiminasi bagi para peneliti khususnya dalam bidang bahasa dan sastra. Meski diselenggarakan secara daring, Semoga tidak mengurangi substansi dari kegiatan ini. Berbagai hasil kajian bahasa dan sastra dalam bingkai literasi digital dan otonomi pendidikan semoga <tuh> semoga dapat saling dibagikan sehingga dapat saling menguatkan satu dengan lainnya. Selain itu, berbagai pemikiran yang baik dan solutif atas berbagai persoalan semoga dapat terlahir dalam forum ilmiah ini. Semoga kolaborasi dan bersinergi perlu kita kedepankan dalam menghadapi situasi pandemi COVID ini. Para hadirin, karena tadi Panitia meminta saya untuk membuka kegiatan ini, maka dengan memohon izin dan ridho Allah SWT, serta ucapan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, secara resmi saya membuka kegiatan International Conference on Language, Literature, Culture, and Education dengan tema Digital Literacy and Autonomy, Current Trends and Practice in Education, Language, Language and Culture secara resmi dibuka. Terima kasih kepada semua pihak yang telah bekerja keras, sekuat tenaga, mempersiapkan kegiatan ini dari awal hingga akhir nanti. Semoga menjadi amal kebaikan atas kemajuan ilmu pengetahuan. Akhir kata, saya ucapkan selamat berseminar, tetap ikuti protokol kesehatan yang ada, semoga kita senantiasa diberi kekuatan dan kesehatan dalam melewati masa pandemi COVID-19 ini. Demikian, dengan memohon maaf atas segala kehilapan dan kekurangan, saya mengakhiri kegiatan apa, ucapan pembukaan ini dengan Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Rektor atas sambutan dan kesediaannya membuka seminar ini secara resmi. Memasuki acara berikutnya, kami mengundang Bapak Dr. Mat Ali MA untuk memimpin doa. I would like to call upon Dr. Mat Ali MA to lead prayer recitation. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hadirin, marilah kita berdoa semoga kegiatan ini dapat berlat, berjalan dengan lancar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahilladzi 'allamal Qur'an khalaqal insana 'allamahu al-bayan. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidil anam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-karam. ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى آخر الأيام يا الله يا رحمن يا متكلم يا معلم البيان كامي من هدرك فوجيدا شكرك هجرتم أتسقال كنيمة بأنذرانيا نعمة إيمان نعمة هداية نعمة هدو نعمة سياحة نعمة أكال نعمة بفكر دن بربهاسة Nikmat mendengar dan berbicara, nikmat menulis dan membaca. Sebagai salah satu wujud syukur atas semua kenikmatan itu, hari ini kami menyelenggarakan seminar internasional tentang kebahasaan, kesusastraan, dan kebudayaan, serta pendidikan dan pembelajarannya. Sebagai hasil kajian ilmiah yang mendalam untuk kebajikan dan kemaslahatan, Hidup manusia sepanjang zaman dalam rangka beribadah kepadamu. Ya Allah, Ya Alim, Ya Qadir. Kami memohon kepadamu semoga seminar ini dapat berlangsung dengan lancar, aman, nyaman, tanpa gangguan, efektif dan efisien, serta dapat menghasilkan ide, gagasan, dan pemikiran yang memberikan pencerahan kepada kami. Untuk meningkatkan berbagai upaya dalam pembelajaran bahasa dan kebudayaan khususnya demi mencerdaskan kehidupan bangsa di masa kini dan masa depan. Ya Allah, Ya Ghafar, kami memohon ampunan jika lau masih banyak kesalahan, sikap, langkah, keputusan dan tindakan kami dalam menjalankan tugas profesional kami selama ini. Karena itu, Ya Rabbana, bimbinglah kami ketika kami tersesat. Ingatkan kami ketika kami lengah dan lupa. Teruskan kami ketika menyimpang. Teguhkan hati kami ketika kami ragu. Dan berilah kami kesanggupan untuk menjalankan kebenaran dan meninggalkan kebatilan dengan ilmu, hidayah, dan hikmah dari ibu. Sehingga kami dapat hidup selamat dunia hingga akhirat Allahumma anfa'na bima 'allamtana wa'allimna ma yanfa'una wazidna 'ilma Allahumma adfa' 'anna al-bala'a wal-waba'a wa qarana wal fitana ma dhahara minha wa ma bata Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanah wa fil akhirat ahsanatan wa qina 'adhaban nar وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا مجيب السائلين بكم الله اسم قدوات ذلك الله سبحانه وتعالى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته بيك هادرين يعني كامي هورماتي Sebelum kita memasuki sesi pertama pembicara kunci, akan kita lakukan sesi foto bersama secara virtual. Hadirin dimohon dapat mengaktifkan kamera dan bersiap untuk difoto. Selanjutnya, kepada panitia dimohon dapat membantu mengondisikan peserta. Terima kasih. Ladies and gentlemen, the last item of the opening ceremony is virtual photo session. All participants are kindly requested to turn on the camera. We would also like to request the conference host to assist the photo session. Thank you. Ya, mohon perhatian Ibu dan Bapak, apakah suara saya terdengar? Terdengar, Tia. Terdengar. Eh, mohon izin saya akan memandu pengambilan eh, sesi foto di sesi kali ini. Silahkan Bapak Ibu yang bisa memungkinkan untuk mengaktifkan kameranya, mohon untuk dapat mengaktifkan kameranya, dan juga memungkinkan juga untuk dapat menggunakan eh, Virtual background juga dapat eh, mohon dapat menggunakan virtual background agar tampilan layar terlihat serasi. 
Selama pengambilan foto, mohon para peserta atau para partisipan tidak ada yang mengirimkan pesan melalui room chat karena itu akan mengganggu pengambilan foto. Di layar komputer saya, itu ada 11 halaman, jadi mohon bersiap karena halaman, tentu saja halaman yang saya ambil akan berbeda dengan halaman Ibu Bapak. Saya akan memulai mengambil halaman pertama. Mohon bersiap. Ya. Satu, dua, peserta akun atas nama Prasuri Kuswari nih, mohon melihat ke kamera. Akun atas nama Prasuri Kita tinggal, mohon, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman kedua. Mohon bersiap, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman yang ketiga. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman yang keempat. Ya, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman kelima, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman enam, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ketujuh, siap, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman kedelapan, mohon bersiap, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman berikutnya, halaman sembilan, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke-10, tidak ada yang mengaktifkan kamera. Halim, halaman ke-11 juga tidak ada. Saya akan mohon, saya akan cek dulu sebentar. Oh, mohon izin, Prof. Nenden, apakah memungkinkan untuk mengaktifkan kamera? Terima kasih. Sesi foto selesai. Saya kembalikan kembali ke MC. Baik, terima kasih. Alhamdulillah acara pembukaan telah usai. Hadirin yang berbahagia, tibalah saatnya kita memasuki sesi pertama pembicara kunci. Sebagai pembicara kunci yang pertama, kami mengundang dengan hormat Ibu Profesor Dr. Nenden Sri Lengkanawati, MPD. Sesi ini akan dipandu oleh Ibu Ika Lestari Damayanti, MA, PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, We have come to plenary session. As the first keynote speaker, we would like to invite Professor Dr. Nendin Tilangkanawati MP to deliver her presentation. The session will be chaired by Ikala Sari Damayanti, MA, PhD. Thank you, uh, Pak Rudi and Ibu Della. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On this occasion, we shall have outstanding presentation from our prominent presenter, whom I believe shall enrich our insight and knowledge regarding learning strategies and learner autonomy in the digital literacy era. Before the presentation begins, please allow me to introduce uh, our first plenary speakers. Ibu Nenden Sri, Lengkawan, Ibu Nenden Sri Lengkanawati is... Um, Is, a, is Professor of English Education at Indonesia University of Education, Bandung. Professor Nenden obtained her master's and doctoral degree in language education from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia with a doctoral dissertation on language learning strategies of student learning English and Indonesian as a foreign language in Australia and in Indonesia. She currently teaches courses at the undergraduate and graduate programs on ELP methodology and curriculum development. Professor Lengkanawati has held several posts in the university, Dean of Faculty of Language and Arts Education from 2005 to 2012, Director of the Language Center from 1998 to 2004, and Chairperson of the Department of English Education from 2002 to 2004. During her deanship, she initiated this conference to showcase scientific achievement in research by new doctorate holders at this faculty. She was once involved as presenter and material developer for the English program on TPI, Televisi Pendidikan Indonesia. She has also presented papers on ELT issues in national as well as international conferences and published articles in journals and co-authored book chapters in the area of ELT teaching and learning. Her publications include journal articles published in Indonesian Journal of Applied Linguistics, 
mostly online with learning strategies. And then in Asian EF, F, EFL journal on cultural differences in language and learning and in language teaching from Cambridge University Press on EL Research Review from 2001 to 2019. And as co-author of book chapters in volumes published by UP Press, which is mostly on education issues and concern, and then by IDP Education Cambodia on learner autonomy in the Indonesian setting, and two books by Rutledge on English as a medium of instruction and on Indonesian EFL teachers' responses to current and future challenges. So ladies and gentlemen, this plenary session is one hour in length uh, with 10 minutes for Jen and answer box and later on Professor Lankanawati will select questions and respond to your question. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Nenden Sri Lankanawati. Thank you, the moderator. Thank you for a generous introduction for me. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is indeed an honor for me to keynote in this academic gathering. I would like to thank Dean of the Faculty of Language and Literature Education and also the conference committee for inviting me to address this esteemed webinar. This is historical for me personally, especially because this year is an important moment in my life. This is my last year of service as a government employee. A very significant experience very significant experience in my academic life in a 36 year span of time. It seems it was just yesterday when I was recruited as an ASN in this alma mater. Ladies and gentlemen, my talk will cover issues on the 21st century, on the 21st century education. Then I'll address the question of why learning strategies and learner autonomy become crucial in the digital age. Important points on the on TPAC will be highlighted, especially about its potential in making teaching and learning activities more effective and efficient. Afterwards, we'll see what research on learning strategies has to say in the Indonesian context, and also how learner autonomy has taken place in the educational context in, of Indonesia. What I would like to underline from my presentation will be put forward before the conclusion of my talk. Ladies and gentlemen, existing education technology standards and frameworks have been offered by national organizations and government education departments. They have been synthesized, for example, by OECD 2005, Partnership for the 21st Century Skills, 2009, American Association of Colleges and Universities, 2007, 21st Century Schools, 2010. All nations around the globe face a growing set of shared problems that will require innovative thinking, resourcefulness, and resilience among the world's population. Ladies and gentlemen, educational, education technology imperatives are swiftly changing worldwide, spanning from 
uh, spending from the government policy level to the level of pioneering educators with their own parts of imaginative and creative technology education using the myriad existing free tools and resources. Care has been taken to situate our analysis in discussions of constraints and benefits contributed by the cultural, socio-political, educational, systemic, and infrastructure differences present across contexts. Although the term 21st century might sound modern, some these skills, it is sound modern, but some of these skills are not new, just newly important. Vital capabilities such as uh, critical thinking and problem solving have always been essential. However, nowadays, because of the emergence demand of knowledge-based economies, these capabilities have gained increasing importance. The exponential growth of information, any content may become obsolete in a new year's time. Continuing, continual updating is the only way to meet the demands of the 21st century. It is expedient that everybody needs to be prepared or the convinced of the need to, to be lifelong learners to keep pace with the evolution of technology. UNESCO then recommended that education be built upon four key pillars, learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to be. These four pillars contribute to the notion of learning throughout life. Ladies and gentlemen, almost two decades after that, in 2015, UNESCO revisited the issue. This time, investigating how the four pillars of education termed transversal competencies are realized in school. Here, I'd like to introduce three international frameworks on the 21st century skills. The first framework was the OECD framework, an attempt to provide clear definitions and understanding of the skills and competencies related to the 21st century. They examined and critically reviewed the effects of ICT on young people together with the consequential changes in the teaching and assessment system. The three major dimension of the framework include communication, information, and ethics and social impact. The second framework is from assessment and teaching of 21st century skills, ATCS. Identifying and helping learners acquire the necessary skills needed to be successful in the 21st century workplace. The ATCS categorized 21st century skills into four prime types, namely ways of thinking, ways of working, tools for working, and living in the world. The third framework is the one introduced by Partnership for 21st Century Skills, abbreviated to P21. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the American organization conceptualized a framework for 21st century skills classified into three just elements, including learning and innovation skills, information media and technology skills, and life and career skills. 
the framework also entails a support system that embodies standards, assessments, curriculum, instructions, professional development, and learning environment. Lipnovich, Rackle, and Robert, in their book entitled Psychosocial Skills and School Systems in the 21st Century, outline the skills we need to develop in, the, in our students in the 21st century. They deal with interrelatedness between the big five of personality and the psychosocial skills, the constructs which are deemed as critical in the schooling context. The big five factors of personality are number one, conscientiousness, tendency to be organized, responsible, and hardworking. Number two, openness to experience. Tendency to be imaginative, curious, and insightful. Number three, extraversion. Tendency to be outgoing, assertive, and energetic. Number four, agreeableness. Tendency to be kind, cooperative, and generous. The last one is emotional stability. Tendency to be free from anxiety, worry, and tension. The psychological skills cover 12 important skills for the 21st century. Creates goal setting, creativity, curiosity, interpersonal skill, leadership, teamwork or collaboration, self-management skills, self-efficacy, tax anxiety, self-esteem and coping. During the 21st century, the introduction of ICT is changing the way we live, work, teach, and learn. It is also challenging the notion of traditional institution-based learning. We keep asking whether the realization of the full educational potential of ICT will make institution-based learning obsolete. It will make learning obsolete. We often question whether tomorrow schools will simply become high-tech, multifunctional community learning center. The digital age, sometimes known as information age, is a historic period in the 21st century, marked by the fast transition from conventional industries brought about by industrial revolution via industrialization to an economy centered on information technology. With the widespread usage of the internet, the digital are began, the, the digital era began in earnest. The digital era began earnest. The digital era is marked by the emergence of online learners who, like language learners in traditional classrooms, utilize techniques related to self-regulation of mental processes as well as communicative or language usage strategies. Review of studies exploring the techniques used by proficient language learners in face-to-face -face settings suggest an interrelationship between the range and frequency of strategies they employ and their performance in the target language compared to competence levels achieved by less successful peers. Similarly, 
more effective learners can be distinguished from less effective learners by the number of range of strategies they use, by the way they apply them, and by the appropriateness of those strategies chosen. As early as 1975, learning strategies had been discussed by Rubin by identifying what the good language learner does and what characteristics he or she has. Rubin identifies seven characteristics. Number one, the good language learner is willing and accurate. Is the learner, the good language learner, is willing and is a willing and accurate guesser. It seems that the good language learner is both comfortable with uncertainty and willing to try out these guesses. The good language learner has a strong drive to communicate or to learn from a communication. He is willing to do many things to get this his message across. Number three, the good language learner is often not inhibited. He is willing to appear foolish if reasonable communication results. He is willing to make mistakes. Number four, the good language learner is prepared to attend to form. The good language learner is constantly looking for patterns in the language. The next characteristics of the good language learners, which is number five, the good language learners practices. He may practice pronouncing words or making up sentences. The good language learners monitor his own and the speech of others. That is, he is constantly attending to how well his speech is being received. And the last characteristics of good language learners, the good language learner attends to meaning. He knows that in order to understand the message, it is not sufficient to pay attention to the grammar of the language or to the surface form of speech. He attends to the context of the speech act. He attends to the relationship of the participants. He attends to the rules of speaking. He attends to the mood of the speech act. The concept of learning strategies has been defined in many ways. Oxford, who is considered as the most referred to about learning strategies, have asked the following questions. Will we hear the strategy research stands no chance? that nobody can agree on a strategy definition. Rebecca Oxford further says that the answers are up to, to strategy experts who wish to serve the needs of learners and teachers. She hopes that we can have a strategy definition garden, a garden that allows us to discover about strategic learning we can then continue to move towards self-regulation and strategic learning for more learners. A study was conducted by Huang in 2016 to see how learners use strategies to solve problems in order to, to fulfill learning needs in different contextual situations. An example of this is the student's extensive use of test wiseness strategies in the exam oriented learning context. Inevitable in learning environment where passing exams is the main target of studying. Some strategies may be of very limited value in longer term process of foreign language learning. It was also found how the variety of strategy used is related to learning modes and learners' motivation 
orientation. In this study, explicit teaching of self-regulation strategies, including self-instruction, self-correction, and self-reinforcement appeared to be necessary in the university freshman English course in order to help participants function more effectively in a learner autonomy oriented learning environment that they were unfamiliar with. This study has also confirmed the fundamental role of learning context. The interplay of individuals, including learner's ability, learning beliefs, and learning motivation with uh, the various elements of their learning context. Learner autonomy has been studied mostly via studies of one's own or other people's experience. And therefore, research on learner autonomy takes many forms such as longitudinal ethnography, narrative inquiry, and case study research. The researcher is generally involved in the issue, often as both a researcher and a teacher. This style of inquiry produces primarily, primarily inductive, context-sensitive, and translational knowledge. Examining unique learning environments from certain theoretical frameworks and techniques of inquiry can help to improve understandings of autonomy in practice. It is true that educational scholars have tendency to take certain stances, the battle and battle for their own points of view. Pollack's notion of avoiding monolithic perspectives is, just, is not just a product of a complex and diverse character of autonomy, but it is also a prerequisite for honest, self-critical inquiry. Ability often replaced by cap capacity, while take charge of is often replaced by take responsibility for and take control of, take con control of one's own learning. The key element in definitions of this kind is the idea that autonomy is an attribute of learners rather than learning situations. Many advocates of autonomy argue that some degree of freedom in learning is required if learners are to develop their autonomy. But most accept that Freedom in learning is not the same thing as autonomy. One thing that should be realized is that autonomous language learning today is very different to what it was in the 1970s. Modes of autonomous language learning are highly sensitive to the availability of resources people, text, media. And in this respect, the rise of digital literacies has had two major consequences. First, there has been the massive expansion of access to resources through the internet for English language learners in particular, but also for learners of other languages. Second, this is reflected in what we might call the locus of control in autonomous language learning. The advent of digital literacies, however, means that autonomous language learning is more likely to be self-initiated and carried out without the intervention or even knowledge of language teachers. 
In the last few decades, the pendulum of foreign language education has swung dramatically from emphasis on teaching method to the, a focus on the learner. The swing of the pendulum suggested a reorientation of teacher roles to share the power with learners and to give them opportunities to take greater control over their learning. This reorientation of classroom roles may facilitate the development of teacher autonomy, or in a broader term, teacher development, teacher autonomy as self-directed directed professional development. It is important for teachers to be aware of teacher autonomy. Technological pedagogical content knowledge. This knowledge goes beyond the three basic elements of TPEC framework, content, pedagogy, and technology. It is rather an understanding created as an interaction among these layers of knowledge by simultaneously integrating knowledge of technology, pedagogy, and content. The importance of integrating the separate, the separate bodies of teacher knowledge into the unified TPAC framework is visible in situation where the introduction of a new technology pushes teachers to keep the equilibrium among the knowledge bases. This confirms the difficult nature of teaching with technology and the need for teachers to develop their technological knowledge alongside other required knowledge domains constantly. We have seven TPEX constructs, TK, PK, CK, PCK, TPK, TCK, and TPEX. Basically, we can see here that TPEX is some kind of amalgamation of all the other six constructs. TPEC is defined as knowledge of using various technologies to teach, represent and facilitate knowledge creation of specific subject contents. For example, knowledge about how to use Wiki as a communication tool to enhance collaborative learning in social science. To respond to what learning strategies students use, I did a case study and reported it in the first scripts published by UP Press last year. The data revealed that compensation strategies with a mean score of 4.57 from the possible highest score of five are the most closely reflective language learning strategies of participants. In contrast, effective strategies with a mean score of 4.17 are the least closely reflective strategies of the participants most of the time. Participants sought to mimic how a native speaker uses a language that is one of the cognitive strategies. Among the strategies known as the compensation strategies, several times participants used new words when they had trouble finding the right ones. Participants paid attention to those speaking in English when defining metacognitive strategies, for example, planning and assessing their learning. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most commonly used effective strategies is to encourage themselves to speak English, even when they are afraid to make mistakes. The last category of the language learning strategies, which is social strategies, the strategy most commonly used by the participants is that if they do not understand something in English, they ask the other person to slow down or to repeat it. The study examined whether there was a significant correlation between the level 
of proficiency of students and the use of language learning strategies and was also expected to reveal whether the skills of students could be related to their autonomy. As shown in the table top right, the data show that students' achievement also had something to do with students' autonomy and language learning strategies. The means for higher achievers in both autonomy and language learning strategies are the highest 48.81 and 112.48. And the means are the lowest, 39.40 and 100 respectively for students with a low level of academic achievement. When we analyze using analysis of variance as seen in table on the bottom right, I only evaluated autonomy, not language link studies, which may be substantially different as students were classified into three different rates of academic achievement. It is in line with what Donye 2011 stated that some of the result of the research show some evidence that learners who can learn independently can become more knowledgeable. Breyer and Oxford 1996 Six, as cited, as cited by Carter and Noonan 2011, stated that greater use of learning strategies is often related to high levels of language proficiency. However, the use of strategy does not always correlate with language proficiency. When I did research for my dissertation, I came to several conclusions regarding language learning strategies. There are indications of the university in the use of language of foreign language learning, foreign language learning strategies in different linguistic contexts, especially in the use of compensation strategies as a strategy that tends to be used with the highest intensity and conversely, in conversely, um, remembering strategy as a strategy that tends to be used with the lowest intensity. The intensity of the use of foreign language learning strategies will vary along with the various cultural conditions of, la of language learning and the status of the foreign language itself and its social and instructional context. The effectiveness of the foreign language learning process within the scope of formal education is determined, among others, by the learning setting and also by the category and focus of language skills and the linguistic components used as learning materials. Language learning strategy is an entity that is characterized by existence of multiple interrelationships between the components of the strategy. This interrelation requires the use of an integrated strategy of all efforts to learn and teach languages, especially foreign languages. Language learning strategies are characterized, characterized by cyclical nonlinear characteristics, both internally among the components of the learning strategy itself and externally in relation to increasing target language proficiency. In this regard, the terms direct strategy and indirect strategy are only valid when applied in relation to the use of the target language directly 
or indirectly when the strategy is implemented. The choice and use of language learning strategies is characterized by a spiral nature in relation to the level of language proficiency possessed by the language learners themselves. The variety of strategy choices and the intensity of strategy utilization will increase and will be more effective as the language proficiency of the language learner is question increases. In other words, the higher the target language proficiency level of language learner and more varied and the higher intensity of using language learning strategies. As early as 1997, I did research for my dissertation in which I found that autonomy was not yet common among Indonesian students. The study involved students from cultural settings, Australian and Indonesian settings. In contrast to the Australian students involved in my study, most of the Indonesian students confessed that they only studied before a test and they just waited for the, the teachers to tell them to do so. In line with this, Darjo Wijoyo, 2001, believed that learner autonomy theories stressed the roles of second language learners as active participants and the teachers as facilitators in the teaching learning process. However, he argued that these roles may work very well in Western context, but not in Indonesian context as the standard norm in the Indonesian culture for good conduct are the principles of total obedience, the unquestioning mind, the concept of elder known all, and the belief that teachers can do no wrong. Autonomous learners have been defined as those who are actively and creatively involved as a manifestation of their positive attitude towards themselves as learners and towards language learning activities in the process of planning, conducting, and evaluating the learning process they encounter. Ms. Starr concluded that students in a higher education institution acquired some degrees of autonomy because metacognitive strategies requires them in uh, because them to independently make plans for their own learning activities. In a somewhat similar vein, Satyadi, 2001, in a study involving university students in Lampung found that when compared with unsuccessful learners, successful learners among the subject utilized more metacognitive strategies involving self-awareness to plan and direct monitor, evaluate or correct strong indicators of LA traits. Likewise, Bruce Lee, and Sugiharto 2001 conducted a study of personality factors involving senior secondary school students in social science, mathematics, and natural science classes to investigate whether field dependent learners and field independent learners were different in their achievement. They found that field independent learners had better achievement in learning English than field dependent learners. In the study reported in this book, to which we, I contribute a chapter on learner autonomy, as the background, I saw a discouraging comparison amongst Asian countries in which Indonesian students rank lowest in terms of higher order thinking abilities. I believe that higher order thinking capacity can only be reached by learners with sufficient learner autonomy. New teaching learning paradigms need to be adopted 
at our schools by avoiding practices utilizing the spoon feeding principle. In the Indonesian context, the autonomy is a necessity and has a significant impact on PFL learning. The teachers in the present study believe that autonomy should be nurtured among learners and that learner autonomy should not be translated as learning without the teacher. There are two seemingly complementary approaches to learner autonomy. Number one, learning outside the classroom independently of teachers and emphasize emphasis on learners control over their own learning without precluding classroom teaching. The teacher in the study revealed that they did provide students with freedom for what and how to learn. However, very often the question of what to learn is left unattended in practice. The teachers in this study indicated more positive views about the desirability than the feasibility of learner autonomy principles. Similar to one of the key findings reported by Borg and Al Busaidi, the Indonesian teachers tended to have some reservations about the feasibilities, the feasibility of teachers and learners negotiating the conduct of the lesson. This was due probably to their belief that their students did not have sufficient knowledge about appropriate methodological alternatives. In this respect, Benson has made, has made it clear that choice and decision-making are not to be all and all of pedagogies for all for LA. As there are the other equally significant factors to attend to, such as considering feedback from students, supporting facilities for the learning process and learning outcomes. LA training proved to enhance the teacher's belief about LA. Constraints that could prevent teachers from developing learner autonomy include limited time allotted in their curriculum and students' lack of autonomous learning experience. In dealing with the constraints, the teachers revealed that they did have access to various resources which could be beneficial in the hands of committed teachers. The key here is committed In 2017, I conducted a study on learner autonomy involving English teachers and came to the conclusion that autonomy was not yet common, uh, common among Indonesian students. But in the Indonesian context, learner autonomy is a necessity and has a significant impact on the EFL, EFL learning. This is also reported in the review research published in Language Teaching by Cambridge in 2020. I also found that many of the learning autonomy principles were not feasible to apply, arguing that Indonesian university students still expected to be spoon fed in their learning. No doubt, sufficient digital literacy is the prerequisite for the success of the 21st century competition in big, uh, as the vehicle for which is enhanced learning strategies and well-developed learning autonomy. We have witnessed how digital literacy has helped us during the pandemic. Of course, the question of teaching effectiveness is lingering. How to make online teaching and learning effective? First, 
And for most, we need to set up good planning, which could be in the form of a lesson plan to provide us with a guide for carrying out all the teaching learning activities. Teaching learning materials should be prepared carefully before the action of teaching begin. And then all the activities should be well designed in detail. Assessment while teaching, well known as formative assessment, should be well prepared. For all these teachers and students must have sufficient digital literacy skills. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe a good lesson plan could be a prerequisite for successful online teaching and learning activities. An on-site lesson plan is certainly different from an online lesson plan. Online lesson plans should be more detailed than classroom lesson plans. There are some similar important things to consider in developing lesson plans for face-to-face -face meetings in class and online. First of all, before teaching, the teacher must first know who the students are from different perspectives, such as age, uh, proficiency levels, cognitive characteristics, and affective characteristics, as well as learning experience. After knowing who the students are that we are going to teach, then we determine the learning objectives. We need to specify the goals. Material coverage and material development need to look at student characteristics and also the learning objectives. And then, especially in online learning, we must determine what the platform to use. We also need then to determine what and how to assess. And after we decide all these things, then we create a scenario for the activity. To have all of these items crystal clear, we certainly need more than just one page lesson plan. We may have a one page lesson, lesson plan summary of the lesson plan, but detailed description is then needed. We have conducted an online survey on what teachers have to say regarding their own teaching activities. There were 23 teachers responding to the questionnaire from across the country, representing junior and high, uh, senior high schools, teachers and lecturers as tertiary institutions. More than 70% of the respondents had some kind of training regarding online teaching, which is good. They use different kinds of online platforms in their teaching. The majority of them use Zoom, WhatsApp, and Google Classroom. Google Meet, Telegram, and Moodle were also used with synchronous and asynchronous modes of teaching. How well prepared are the English teachers in conducting online teaching? More than 50% of them reported that they did not have sufficient time to prepare for their online teaching. The majority of, uh, the majority of them thought that lesson planning for online teaching is different from, the, from that of face-to-face teaching. However, when asked about teaching objectives, almost all, of them, almost all of them said that they were basically the same as in the face-to-face -face teaching classes. During online sessions, there were three types of activities. 44% of the teachers would tend to conduct individual work while 40% of them would carry out pair work, group work was done by only 16% of them. 
as he got practice in using English, almost all of the teachers did that. With only one teacher did very little in using English due to the tendency of conducting text-based teaching in the session. Online teaching creates its own problem in monitoring and assessment. During the online session, it is difficult for the teachers to monitor whether each of the students, each of the students is involved in the session. There are some ways that the teachers reported to handle to handle this issue, to handle this problem of monitoring students' involvement. Uh, among others, by giving questions or quizzes, keeping the camera on, watching students' facial expressions, checking students' responses to posts, seeing activities via Google Form, providing interactive activities, filling out the attendance list. Assessment is reported as consisting of formative and summative assessment with a combination of two of the two was reported to be conducted by a little more than 40% by the teachers followed by formative assessment practiced by more than 30% of them and summative assessment by a little over 25% the teacher reported difficulties in assessment, such as making sure they did it themselves, ensuring students work honestly, assessing the authenticity of the students' work, and making sure students work to their, their maximum capacity. There are constraints and challenges reported by the teachers. Technical difficulties faced by the teachers include unstable internet connection, camera off due to the students' difficulty, activities hard to control, late login by the students, students' limited internet data quota. Some other problems students did not own smartphones that's very sad right and last but not least teachers limited it literacy teachers also reported some non-technical constraints such as difficult to assist students individually students did not turn in assignments student teacher interaction difficult to carry out some students never join online sessions. Parents complains about students' insufficient mastery of the subject. Insufficient involvement of students. Students' passiveness due to boredom. Online teaching has its advantages as well as its advantages. As reported by the teachers, the pluses of online teaching include technologies make teaching and learning neat and interesting, more efficient for presentation and effective in motivating students, more creativity on the part of both teachers and students. Students become better literate in technologies. Learning could take place almost anytime and anywhere, making students more autonomous. Despite the advantages, there are some minuses reported by the teachers, which include teachers students report lacking is lacking. Difficult to establish teaching learning nuances in its entirely. Focus is more on teaching and lacking in evaluation and assessment. 
difficult to monitor and control students' involvement, honesty, and achievement. Students are confused due to lack of direct face-to-face -face guidance, no quick assistance when technology value occurs. In anticipating and handling problems before, during, and after an online session, teachers reported to do any or a combina combination of the following activities. Activating platforms such as WhatsApp groups, SMS, and video calls to compensate for constraints. Then, breakthrough breakout rooms conducted during online sessions to provide assistance to individual students facing difficulties. One teacher reported that he conducted home visit. Do you believe it? He conducted home visit to each individual student. Did you develop additional material that could be posted in accessible platforms such as WhatsApp groups and uh, SMS? Teachers consulted with techie colleagues to handle technological problems. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some points that I would like to underline from my presentation. First, learning strategies can be seen as having a significant impact on enhancing the learner autonomy. Second, as now we have been encouraged to implement our professional duties online. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe that learner autonomy could significantly help online teaching and learning. Third, due to technological advancement in which learners are expected to work mostly on their own, learner autonomy become uh, inevitable prerequisite for the 21st century competition. Therefore, the four points is the importance of digital literacy, which has become the success in global competition. And last but not least, technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge what teachers of the 21st century should possess. Thank you very much for a very kind attention. Thank you, Ibu Nenden, for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, now we invite you to ask questions or Give comment to the uh, re related to the presentation uh, from Professor Nenden Sri Lankanawati. Okay, let's have a look at the chat box. If you are not really sure asking question in English, I think it's okay if you would like to ask your questions or comment in Bahasa Indonesia as well. Uh, we can, yes. One yes, Ibu participant, Rita. Ibu Rita. Yeah. Maybe she can ask questions by opening oh, the yeah. mic. Thank you very much for the opportunity for me to ask you questions. I'm very proud of your presentation. It's a very excellent one. But I'm afraid that uh, nowadays, you know that we are having this online class, but not all teachers, not all lecturers are ready to have this. Uh, how to overcome this? Because so many friends of mine, you know, so many friends, they ask me again and again, but I couldn't answer it. And also it's quite difficult for them because they are all, sorry to say, they are all old, sorry to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Yes, thank you, Ibu Rita. Prof. Nenden. Thank you, Ibu Rita. Thank you very much for the question. I have been looking for the questions through, through uh, the chat, but nobody asked me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, as uh, I have mentioned in my uh, research, that uh, you know, uh, some teachers also have difficulties in carrying out the uh, online teaching. And anyway, there is no way for us that uh, in the pandemic situation, we have to uh, teach, right, online. In this case, you know, uh, based on my uh, research also that uh, some teachers, uh, you know, are not capable of, uh, you know, are not capable of uh, carrying out the, uh, what's that, the uh, class, online class. Mm -hmm. In uh, my opinion, teachers need to be curious and uh, want to learn new things, I think, right? Uh, teachers first to be, uh, you know, need to be autonomous because in this digital era, I think my, uh, most, uh, most of the students are digital, uh, what's that? Mm, natives, okay? That's why as a teacher, we have to be, that's I told you to have to be curious. Otherwise, we'll be left behind by the students. It is a must for the teachers to uh, try to self-develop themselves, especially in the time being, not only about the content. Mm -hmm. If I told, as I told you about, about the content and then uh, uh, was that in TPEC, content knowledge and also pedagogical knowledge, not only how to, the theory about how to teach, but in this case, the teacher should be you know curious in improving themselves how to teach in online teaching, not on only on uh, on site teaching, because in terms of online teaching in this uh, uh, in this situation. It is hard for us to, uh, you know, to uh, correct the students and also to try to uh, monitor the students personally. Maybe if, if the teacher are very capable in using all the, uh, you know, technological, uh, you know, things, maybe it won't, uh, you know, be hard for the teacher to do it. Okay. I think, uh, thank you for the... Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank questions. you. Ibu Nenden, we have two questions. First from Pak Subandrio and second one from Pak Douglas. Yeah? First from Pak Subandrio. Do you think that online study in Indonesia run effectively? Perhaps you can respond to that one first. Okay. Uh, Moderator, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Please. Do you think that online study or online learning in Indonesia run effectively, Ibu? What do you think? Okay, this is for Pak Subandio, right? Pak Subandio, yes. Okay. Uh, well, it depends on where and who the teachers are. Okay. Because, for example, the teachers are very knowledgeable about technology, about the pedagogical knowledge, about content knowledge. But if, for example, it is hard to uh, have the internet, uh, internet access, mm. this also would be the problem, right? Okay, so the success of the online teaching, uh, I think not only based on the teacher's knowledge in terms of applying the uh, online teaching, it's not only uh, you know the teacher's uh, knowledge about the content knowledge, but also it will also uh, has something to do with the you know the technology and also the position. Maybe you have heard about you know some uh, students uh, needs to climb up <laughs> to the. Uh, for example, to the second floor of the house, or even, you know, some of them are, has to climb, uh, you know, more than that, uh, you know, to uh, get the access to the internet. Mm -hmm. That's why in my research, one of the, the teachers here told me that even they, you know, they 
just try, uh, he just tried to uh, do the home visit because it is hard to get the internet. Okay, thank you, Pa Subandrio. Yes, Bunilla, thank you for your response. And I think it relates as well to what uh, Pa Douglas asked. How could the TPEC framework you talk about earlier be useful in helping teachers expand their repertoire for teaching online? Okay. Well, talking about TPEC, mm -hmm. I think uh, TPEC technological, pedagogical content knowledge. Yes, indeed, of course, TPEG is very useful. As long as the teacher is good at integrating technology, pedagogy, and the content, this is very important. So the teacher should know how to integrate technology, pedagogy, and the content. The teacher also needs to be good at the three areas, right? I think I have to, you know, mention it in my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Yes, uh, Ibu Bapa, I think we still have around five minutes. If you still have question, yes, uh, yes, we have one more question, Ibu. Uh, in your presentation, you explained about several strategies in managing online teaching constraints. Uh, among all those strategies, which one do you think should be put in priority? Okay, this is from not from Ibu Habdarani, right? No, it's from, from just a minute. Let me take a look at from room again. five. I can't really read okay. name. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see again. <laughs> Okay, I explained about several strategies in managing online uh, teaching constraints. Among all those strategies, which ones should we put pri priority? And number one is, this is the most, uh, I mean, the most difficult one, to make the students' involvement. That is, the, that is number one. Okay, because, you know, so, uh, however, we are good at, you know, uh, doing the, the other things about the constraints, right? Without student involvement, I think it would be hard to, uh, you know, the success to come by. Okay. Yeah. Are you going yeah. to uh, go? I think uh, if this is the last one, Ibu moderator, is it okay if I need to, uh, you know, to answer Ibu Habdarani's question? Yes, uh, yeah, from Ibu Hafdarani, yes, go ahead, Ibu. Oke, okay, permasalahan yang sering dihadapi dalam pengajaran bahasa asing diantaranya adalah karena guru tidak menggunakan bahasa asing yang diajarkan sebagai bahasa pengantar dalam menjelaskan sesuatu, sehingga siswa tidak terbiasa mendengarkan bahasa asing yang dipelajari terutama dari gurunya sendiri. Bagaimana, ya, yeah, oke, okay. Ibu Hafdarani, that's right, oke. Okay. This is the most important thing. If we teach, you know, a, a foreign language, we have to use, uh, you know, the target language. But suppose you have done, I know that you are, you, you teach uh, German, right? Okay. Every time in the first place, you have to use German, of course, not to use uh, Bahasa Indonesia. So that, yeah, I agree with, with your uh, opinion. Thank you, Ibu. Okay, the target language exposure is also very, is not, it's also, yeah. It is very, very important, especially for, for a German language, for example. Uh, it is hard for us to find exposure, right? For English, I remember when I taught pronunciation practice, for example, when I taught Ibu Ika, sorry, Ibu Ika's generation. <laughs> it was hard for me to teach them how to pronounce F. Do you remember Wika? That's why yes. I, I gave, you I gave them you know, some examples of saying F like this. F, F, F. Because every time I said, okay, uh, some some students cannot cannot uh, you know, pronounce the word F. And then when I said, okay, hold it, F. And then finally when I said, okay, now you said F. Di lepas jadi F lagi gitu ya. Okay. All right, Ibu Habdarani. Uh, especially for German language, it is, it is uh, 
a must for the teachers in the German language to use German so that the students will have, uh, you know, uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. For me, now I'm still teaching non-system practice. I don't know why I've given this, uh, you know, since a long time ago and until now. <clears throat> it is not hard. We got to teach them pronunciation practice now. It is not hard because no problem because exposure everywhere. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Prof Nenen. Yes, and thank you, Bu Hafdarani, for the question. Yes, Ibu Bapa, I have checked with the committee that we still have time for around. Uh, another four minutes. So if you still have questions or comments, please do use this um, at the time for asking questions to Ibu Nenden because it's very interesting uh, topic that she presented to us. I'm worried that it is over time. It's okay? Yeah, it's up to 9.40. Yeah. Okay, but if you don't have any, yes? I think somebody just turned on his or her microphone, yeah? Or nobody? <laughs> oh, yes, we have one more question from Pak Dedi Suheri. Learning independence is one of the learning objectives set by higher education. How to measure aspects of students' independence in learning and study habits during the pandemic? Best regards book from Padedi Suheri from EIEN Langsa. Okay, this is uh, our problem, right? Mm -hmm. Learning independence is one of the learning objectives set by higher education. That's right, especially in the 2013 curriculum right it is uh, mentioned that uh, you know i know this is uh, different from you know learner autonomy learning strategies uh, and learner centered in the 2013 curriculum even not in the university level but in high school in uh, elementary school up to the high school uh, we have to try to you know to apply what so called learner centered teaching not teacher centered teaching right uh, as far as I know, many teachers still uh, using teacher-centered, okay? Uh, they forget about the students, yeah? In my opinion, you know, the success of the teaching and learning process, not only on the hand of the teacher, but also how the students could learn independently, okay? Could learn independently so that uh, the teacher just, you know, give a uh, highlight or just, you know, guide the students how to do things independently. Now, when we come to learning independence, how to measure it? Okay, learning independence measuring by looking into their responses and completion of a completion of the task and also we can also ask the student to write what so called learning strategies okay in uh, oxford uh, you know uh, learning strategies inventory one of the uh, set uh, strategies which is very very powerful in teaching independent in learning independently is write a learning journal okay mm -hmm. the teacher could ask the students to do it and then try to take a look at their activities ask them to write everything in the learning journal even they, they are, you, you can ask them to write their feeling, their feeling about learning, their feeling about the teacher, of, of course. Just uh, ask them to freely uh, write everything in their, in their uh, set uh, journal or diary. I call it learning diary. Their feeling about the teacher. Maybe uh, at the same time, you can, uh, you can improve the students' uh, English ability in writing. Ask them to write in English. Okay. For example, the feeling about the teacher. For example, today I have 
a lesson from uh, Pak Dedi. And I like it very much because Pak Dedi explained it very well. But I still, I still don't understand about blah, blah, blah. I think uh, this is uh, what kind of one of the assessment of uh, whether the students uh, learn independently or, or not. Mm. This is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Nenden. Uh, it is really interesting and useful presentation for all of us, especially in this pandemic era where we face so many challenges with online learning. Actually, we still have two more questions, but we have come to the end of our session. Uh, Pak Subandrio and also other participants who would like to discuss this further with Ibu Nenden, I think you can contact Ibu Nenden via email, yeah, Ibu Nenden, if it is okay. Yes, um, yes. Let me, yes, uh, let me quote Pak Professor Bahrudin's uh, comment on Ibu Nenden's presentation. Excellent presentation you have made, Ibu. You are great. And I totally agree with Pak Bahrudin's statement. And that uh, Thank you. brings us to the end of our session. Thank you very much. And please give a big round of applause or virtual clap, clap, clap in the chat box, Ibu Bapak. Thank you very much, Ibu Nenden. Yeah, and now I hand it over to Ibu Dela and Pak Rudi. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih pada Prof. Nenden yang telah memberikan materi yang luar biasa dan Ibu Ika yang sudah memandu acara. Uh, sesi pertama pembicara kunci telah selesai. Uh, kami kantikan kembali, hadirin mohon dapat mengisi daftar hadir yang sudah disediakan panitia di ruang obrolan. And we'd like to remind all the participants to fill in the attendance list that shared in the chat room. Thank you. Hadirin yang kami hormati, uh, untuk sesi yang kedua, dengan hormat kami mengundang Bapak Profesor Douglas K. Hartman sebagai pembicara kunci yang kedua. Sesi ini akan dipandu oleh Bapak Dr. Budi Hermawan, MPC. Ladies and gentlemen, for the second plenary session, we'd like to call upon Professor Dr. K. Hartman as the keynote speaker to deliver his presentation. And the session will be chaired by Dr. Budi Hermawan and please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, MC. Uh, oh, Budi sal Hermawan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, everyone, all the uh, participants and presenters, welcome to the second session. And in the second session, we are going to listen and later ask questions to uh, the second uh, keynote speakers, Professor Douglas K. Hartman. Uh, before we start, um, I would like to read his uh, short bio for you. Okay. Um, Professor Douglas K. Hartman is going to present a presentation with the title of How Digital Literacies Are Reshaping the New Oratory Implication for Teaching Language and Literature. Uh, professor Douglas is a professor of technology and human learning in the College of Education at Michigan State University. He serves on faculties in the Language and Liter Literacies and Educational Te Technologies programs. Uh, Professor Hartman has authored more than 70 journal articles, wow, book chapters and technical reports and book reviews. Uh, you are kindly uh, you are kindly invited to later on uh, check on his uh, writing. Among his publications are chapters in the handbook of uh, multi multiple source. Uh, sorry. Among his publications are chapters in the handbook of multiple source use, handbook of reading research. Handbook of Research on Teaching and Teaching the English Language, Art, and Handbooks of Research on Literacy and Diversity, a research review that examines the shift from prints to pixels, the evolutions of cognitive conceptions of reading comprehension, and an essay on the influence of media on literacy in the next millennium in reading research quarterly. Professor Hartman's research interests focus on technology, learning, and literacy uh, focus on technology, learning, literacy, and language in global context. Professor Hartman has received the prestigious Albert J. Kingston Award from the Literacy Research Association for his distinguished scholarly service to the field of literacy. 
Okay, everyone, without further ado, uh, I, I now uh, would like to invite Professor Hartman to um, deliver his presentation. Professor Hartman, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Huh? Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, yes. Your in voice is in in It's an honor to join this fifth international conference on language, literature, culture, and education. Uh, I feel like I'm among very esteemed colleagues. And uh, I feel right at home because of that. It's a very late hour where I live in the United States. Uh, so I've had my cup of tea with lots of caffeine to keep <laughs> me going. <laughs> and I, I did a few exercises just a, a couple of minutes ago to get my blood flowing. Uh, so I'm, I'm ready to go here. Uh, I, uh, I would like to make sure that my slides come through okay. And I see that I'm not, I'm not able yet to for screen sharing. So if someone could just turn that on, I'd be glad to share my slides. While I'm waiting for that, um, I wanna thank uh, so many people for the invitation to talk about digital literacies and autonomy. Uh, Dr. Nenden just spoke and gave a, a very insightful presentation and uh, I was grateful for her words of wisdom and insight. Um, I know that your Dean and Professor, Dr. Hardini, is also with us here at the conference. Uh, and I want to thank her and her role as a leader in helping make this possible. And as well, your Vice Rector for Education and Student Affairs, uh, Dr. Sukiati, uh, thank you as well. There are certainly many other esteemed colleagues here, uh, too many to name, but I'd like to thank you as well and especially the organizers and planners who were the hands and the minds that helped bring all this together. Uh, I worked most closely interacting uh, with Lulu Laela uh, La uh, Amalia. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all the hard work that you did, important work that you did. I mostly like to thank you as participants for really committing uh, to participating with the ideas that will be a part of this conference. Uh, so I'm going to check here and make sure my slides can be shared. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you for doing that. So you should be able to see my, my title yep. slide here, how digital literacies yep. are reshaping the new oratory. Is that coming through okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can clearly see your slides here. Professor. Good. All right. So to my way of thinking, you and I have the best jobs in the world, and the most important ones too. Why? Well, in the next few minutes, I want to share why I think this is so. To explain, I want to begin by sharing four photographs. I'll share those in just a moment. And these photographs represent how digital literacies are reshaping what some scholars are calling the new oratory. Now, what, what, do, what does that expression mean, the new oratory? Well, it simply means that there are new formats for public speaking that have been developing for teaching, for presentations and speeches in many different sectors, whether it be education, business, politics, civic life, and so on. Now, to summarize what I just said, this, this new oratory really refers to something as short as this. There are new forms of public speaking, whether they be in a classroom, at the workplace, or in public. And they've developed over the last 20 years. Another way to say that is that there are new public speaking genres that have developed. And they've developed largely because of digital technologies, which permit a type of autonomy that hasn't been possible in, in many, many previous decades, and some would say previous century. So what are those four photos I mentioned just a moment ago? Uh, and what new oratories do they represent? Let me show you those four photos. Here's the first one. Uh, this is probably the most well-known 
new oratory. You recognize this? A TED talk. Yep. These short talks, as you know, which can be no longer than 18 minutes, focus on a single topic or question. Uh, that they could focus on the question, do schools squelch creativity? Or does body language affect how others see us? Or how do you spot someone who's lying? They've been quite engaging and of wide interest around the world. They're an example of this new oratory. Another new speaking genre in this new oratory is called the investor pitch. These are short talks. They're usually no more than a few minutes, sometimes a little longer, and they focus on persuading investors to give money to promising business ideas. So the goal of these talks or these pitches is to raise cash to get money to produce a new product or service. A third example of this new oratory is the webinar, the training webinar. We've all been doing these, it seems like, in the last year especially. And these presentations or lectures, they vary widely in length. Uh, I've seen some webinars that are, that are five minutes, five minute webinar, or some others that are longer, that might be five hours. But they're clearly online educational events that occur in many different sectors of life these days. And they can be on topics like how to start a business or how to explain a really complex idea, even how to be a better teacher. And the fourth photo I'll show you, which is another example of these new public speaking genres, is called the three minute thesis. Now, the way these work, you have, to, you have to use your imagination just a little bit. You have 180 seconds. And, and during those 180 seconds, you present your dissertation research. That's all you have. Okay? Three minutes. You have to take all that work and condense it into three minutes. Somebody says, go, and you need to start talking. And so it requires quite a bit of preparation and, and skill to do that in a way that's, that captures the study and is engaging as well. These, these are competitions that, are, that have been held. Uh, I think last year there were over 200 universities that held three minute thesis competitions. And there are prizes. And some of those prizes are quite a bit of money, up to $5,000. So this is another example of the uh, new oratory genres. Now, there are certainly other examples, but I'm focusing on these four here because they're a shorthand way to illustrate how digital literacies are facilitating a range of new public speaking formats that help facilitate autonomy, whether it be in the public sector, business, education, or research. There are two things now I'd like to point out about these four photos. Uh, because I think they illustrate what is really new about the new oratory. And one of those things I want to point out is the setting in which these oratories occur. Uh, um, and then the other thing I'd like to point out is something about the communicating that occurs. And I think these two aspects of the new oratory are important because our students, your students and my students, will increasingly work in a set of world cultures where the expectations for public speaking will be shaped by certain values. They might be new values. And we, we want to acquaint them with those values and expectations. My own children, uh, my wife and I have three children, I have talked with them about these this new oratory. Uh, they're in college and I have one in high school. And we want them to be aware uh, that there are many forms of oratory and that there's a new, been a newer one emerging. And what does it look like? How do you engage in it? And as a professor at Michigan State University, I also work with my students who will become new teachers in many subject areas. How do you engage your students in assignments and projects that, that have features 
of this new oratory. Well, I'm not the only one who thinks this, the, this new oratory is of great value. There are other people as well. One of them is someone named Chris Anderson, and he's pictured here. Uh, Chris is the, the gentleman who runs the TED Talks uh, that have been so famous worldwide. And this is what he says about the new oratory. He says that when you master it, it's a superpower. That those individuals in today and tomorrow's world have an advantage if they learn this form of oratory along with others. They're kind of like, it's kind of like having a superpower. Uh, beyond individuals, there are organizations that have spoken about the new oratory. Pictured here is a report by the McKinsey Consulting Firm. And they, they do advising to corporations, governments, and other organizations all around the world. And this is what they say about the new oratory. They say it's a killer skill. And, and by that killer, the word killer, they're not taking it literally. They're just saying it's the kind of skill that's so powerful that it almost gives you an unfair advantage if you can speak in a new oratory form. It's really impressive and it's persuasive. You might be familiar with this face. Uh, his name is Warren Buffett. And he is a global business magnet. Uh, he's considered one of the most successful investors in the world. Uh, he's currently he's the seventh wealthiest person on the planet. And this is what he says about the new oratory. He says that it'll improve your value by 50%. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. If you learn this one skill, the new oratory, that it would improve your value considerably, but also others around you that you, you work with and that you live with. Certainly in the educational sector, there's been attention paid to the new oratory. Uh, UNESCO, for example, which lays out 21st century skills for education worldwide states that students who learn the new oratory will have a multiplier effect. And what that means is that competence in the new oratory will really amplify what they're able to do across the lifespan many times over. And here in the US, our, our standards, which have been adopted by many states, they're called the Common Core State Standards. Uh, they mentioned the new oratory 187 times in the standards document. That's just a remarkable number. There, there's there's a great awareness that we want people to be tuned in to how to use digital media uh, uh, in, in ways that promote autonomy and, and engagement. So those are examples of how others have made the argument that the new oratory is really essential for us today, but especially for those that we were working with in the, the generation ahead. So I want to turn now really quickly and first look at the settings of the new oratory. Uh, and then following the setting, we'll take a look at communicating. So first setting, uh, to look more closely at the setting, I'll go back to these four pictures. And these photos again are selected because I think they highlight four features that are very common when it comes to the setting of the new oratory. So what's the first feature? Well, as you can see in the middle of the screen, uh, it's, uh, there's an open stage, okay? So what does that mean, there's an open stage? Well, if you look at the TED Talk in the upper left corner, you can see that there's no podium, there's no pulpit, there's no lectern, there's no desk in front of the speaker. It is open, it's an open stage. There's simply the speaker standing there and the stage is bare. So the idea here is to promote openness, accessibility, as if the speaker's talking right to you, whether you're in a big audience or online, virtually, through a tool like Zoom. If in the photo 
of the investor pitch in the upper right. You can see the man standing. There's nothing in front of him. He's just him and his audience. Uh, and then even when you're presenting or teaching online, the case is the same in these two bottom photo photos. There's really nothing but open space between the person teaching or speaking and the audience that's there virtually. And even though there are many miles between the virtual speaker and the audience, the idea is to communicate openness and have no barriers or anything in front. So this is one of the features of the new oratory. And that is the open stage setting. Now let's take a look at a second feature. And it is called a frontline position. And uh, what this simply means is that the speaker is slightly in front of anything else on the stage. They are closest to the audience or the class. So if we zoom in on the trainer who's presenting a webinar in the lower left, he's slightly in front of his slides. And if we look in the upper right photo at the investor pitch, he also is standing slightly in front of the monitor, off to the side, of course, so everyone can see the monitor, but he's, he's, he's the main attraction. And the idea here is that the speaker or the teacher is really the main focus. We don't want them behind anything, and we want them in the front. So, so the speaker should be in front of any visual aids that are serving the backup role for their talk. So the second common feature is, is that of being in the frontline position, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. The third feature is of setting is that there is a screen nearby. And that's true in all four of these photos. In fact, it's, a, it's almost assumed today uh, in these newer genres that there's some type of visual aid that will accompany a speaker and serve as a backup to what the speaker is saying. Notice the TED speaker in the upper left corner. In this photo, uh, the screen is actually above the speaker to his right to make it visible in a larger auditorium. And in the three minute thesis presenter, the screen is to her left and its height is roughly from her elbow to the top of her head and it's slightly behind her. So as you can see in all these photos, the third common feature of the new oratory is a screen nearby. The fourth and final feature of the setting is <clears throat> that it's informal, There's, the staging is informal. So, so what does that mean? Uh, well, let me ask you a question. Do you see someone wearing a suit jacket or tie that's presenting? Nobody really dressed up. No, you don't. Right? No. You see anybody uh, you know, wearing a dress really fancy? No. Well, the clothing worn by presenters in the new oratory is informal or casual. Uh, they're, they're wearing button-up shirts, mostly an open collar, no suits or ties. Uh, the idea is to be able to relate in the way you look and kind of being like everybody else. And if we look at the investor pitch in the upper right photo, <laughs> I, I laughed when I saw this photo because he's wearing shorts. The presenter is wearing shorts and he's asking the people there for $20 million to invest in his new product. That's a pretty casual dress style that he's wearing. It's a little bit uncomfortable for my taste. Uh, I appreciate the spirit of informality, but, but uh, I would dress up a bit more if I were doing this. But, but this seems to be going well, and I think it did. Notice that also some of the listeners here, those people who have the money that are considering giving it to invest in this new product, they're also wearing shorts. A few of them are, and some are even wearing t-shirts. So this idea of informal staging is the fourth characteristic of the new oratory. 
So I went through those four features rather quickly. So let's review. Uh, if you want to, feel free to take a photo of these. Uh, it started out by saying that an open stage is one of the features of this new oratory. There's nothing between the speaker and the audience. Uh, the speaker is in a frontline position, meaning they're slightly in front of anything else on the stage or on the screen. And then there is a screen nearby to provide visual aids as a backup support with the speaker saying. And then finally, uh, wh while the speaker and the audience are there, there's a kind of informality to it all. Uh, it, it could be casual clothing, or, uh, furniture set up, and so on. So there's certainly more than four features to the setting, but uh, because of time, I'm going to move on and talk about the second big idea, the second big part of, of my conversation with you, and that's communicating. This is the other aspect of oratory. Uh, I want to talk about it by taking another look at these four photos, because I think there's an important aspect of communicating that they all share. And it's this, it's that communication that's valuable makes use of what's visual. The new oratory, really is a visual communication. All four presenters here are using slides of some sort that have images and words on them, support what they're saying out loud. They're not reading the slides. Okay? They're using the slides as a support because they are the presenter. The slides aren't the presenter. And these look to be like pretty good visual aids to assist in their visual communication. So I, I recently participated in a panel about how to communicate effectively visually. And I wanna show you a couple of slides here. Uh, this, this first one is the speaker who spoke just before me at, a, at, this, at this panel this few months ago. This was the slide. My first response was, I was visually overwhelmed by this slide. There's a lot of print here. On, and that large multicolored heading, it was difficult for me to read. And I thought the content on the slide uh, seemed to be helpful information, but I kept losing track of what the panelist was saying out loud and what I was trying to read on the slide. So I was troubled by the slide for some reason. And I thought about it all day. And when I got home that evening, I mentioned it to my wife. And she's a teacher. And she said, I have to show you a slide that I saw today in a workshop in the school district I work in. So this is the slide she saw. And, and I, I uh, laughed a little bit because uh, there's so many moving parts on this slide. And I wondered, could I pay attention to what was being said? And I wondered how helpful or how confusing uh, this slide was in communicating clearly what teachers need to do when they move to online instruction. So I was troubled by this slide as well. And in fact, I shared it with one of our daughters and she said, dad, I have a slide to share with you. And so this is the slide she shared. And I had to squint. Uh, to see the print on this one. But maybe it's, you know, I have some visual challenges. Uh, and I, I wondered, is this slide really helpful or confusing for students and what they need to learn? Uh, to me, it was barely readable. So before I went to bed that night, uh, and this all happened in one day, I, I thought, I'll look online and see what some other educators have created for slides. And I found a teacher who had created slides to teach his classroom rules and procedures. And uh, this is what I saw. I saw that he had created some interesting, an interesting title slide for the classroom rules. And there were some other slides that followed it. And there were others that followed those and still others. And even more, <laughs> as I looked through these, I started to feel a little bit sad for the students 
in the class. They were fourth and fifth graders. And in total, there are 54 slides of rules and policies for the class. Uh, and there are over 3,000 words on those slides. And if I was trying to think of the kids in Matt, experiencing these slides on the first day of school, it, it took probably about 45 minutes to get through them all. They, they, I, I'm not sure they really got it all. So I went to sleep that night feeling like we really need to think about visual communication. And I wondered, like, what's happening to teaching and learning as vast numbers of educators are suddenly using slides more than they ever have to communicate, to teach? Are the slides really helping or hindering? Uh, I have to say that I'm confident that the slides I shared with you were used with the best of intentions. Uh, they seem to be communicating really good content. But I came away with a question from that day. And I wondered, what could we do better as educators when communicating visually with slides? What could we do better? Whether we're working with children, with colleagues at work, with faculty at the university, or our parents in the community. I knew that there had to be better ways of using slides to communicate visually, whether face-to-face -face or online. Well, I looked back through some of my own slides the next day, and I have to say, I was pretty embarrassed. Uh, I was guilty of some of the same things, and I was humbled because uh, I wasn't pleased with what I saw. So I set out on a mission to learn from myself and for others and my students to answer this question. What could I do better when communicating visually with slides? So in the next few minutes that remain, um, I want to just share with you some very practical and fundamental things about visual communication, especially with slides that are related to this new oratory. Now, the findings that I'll share are not revolutionary, but they're very fundamental. And they're fundamentals that, that I was never taught. And I found that few educators know, few business people know. To uh, public officials know. And uh, so uh, I didn't realize that there's a professional knowledge and a research base about visual communication. To share what I've learned, I'm going to ask five questions and just quickly give you the answers to them. Uh, keep in mind that they, they might seem like basic questions at first, but the answers have profound impact on the learning on the understanding of those that we're working with. So quickly, here's the first question. What colors make a slide easier to read? What colors do you think? If you had to pick a background color and then the color of the words, what colors make the, the slide the most easiest to read? Got a, got a couple colors in mind? Well, the answer to this question is a little bit tricky. It's not really specific colors, but it's really a concept. And it's the concept of contrast. That if we maximize the difference, the contrast of difference between the background and the text, that makes it easiest to read. Well, what, what colors do that? What colors have the most contrast? Well, not surprisingly, a white background with black text provides maximal contrast. And we can reverse those. We can have a black background in white text, and it does the same thing. There's a sharp contrast there. And it makes it visible, especially for an audience or students who might have some visual challenges. They might be colorblind, uh, vision impaired in some, of some sort. But it need not be just black and white, there can be other colors too. So if we use a blue background and white text, that's, that's great contrast there. Or we could have a white background and blue text. So again, the idea is not to pick specific colors for text and background, but to maximize contrast. 
Now, there's a real quick and easy way to, to find out what's good contrast. And I remember learning about this when I was a kid in elementary school, and it's to use the color wheel. And you might remember back earlier in your own learning, uh, learning about colors around this wheel. And you can see here that against this black background, some colors just stand out. Uh, we say they pop, okay? they, they just really catch our eye. So the yellow, the very top against the black background, that stands out. But if we change the background to white, that yellow doesn't stand out as much. Okay? We might pick another color, like maybe the blue in the lower left, that, that stands out better against the white. So here's the principle, that opposite colors on the color wheel provide the most contrast. So let's pick these two colors here, purple and orange. They're opposite each other. And let's create a slide. And so if we do, the slide looks like this. Now that's pretty visible, that's a nice contrast. And we can even reverse it, orange background and purple text, and you still get a good contrast there. Some people might not like the orange background, but at least the contrast is fairly sharp there. Now, opposites provide high contrast. Guess what promotes low contrast? Well, it's colors that are next to each other. Okay, so the idea here is adjacent colors provide the least contrast. And so if we pick these two colors here on the right, red and red orange, guess what happens? Low contrast. It's, you know, especially for some child or uh, a person in the audience who has some color blindness. That's difficult to see. And even if we reverse the colors, it's tough to see there. So I've taken a little bit of time to talk about this first question because color really is important. Um, you know, what colors really make a slide easier to read? And you know the answer now. It's contrast. Okay? You want to maximize contrast. So let's go to the second question. What font styles make a slide easier to read? Uh, we all have our kind of favorite fonts. Turns out that at least in Roman or Latin characters, sans serif fonts have been shown to be the most readable, most easily readable. So what are those? Well, to explain that, they're really, at least in Latin characters, two general categories of fonts. You see on the left here, there's serif fonts, and on the right, the sans serif. What are serif? Well, they are a couple of examples here, Georgia, Times New Roman, and Courier. They are fonts that have a little fancy ornate feet and little things added to the letters. Uh, those are called serifs, the little additions. And it turns out that on a screen with small or really large projected on the wall and the lighting might not be good, it's tougher to read those. So it's preferable to use sans serif. And the word sans, of course, means without the serifs. Notice that these are pretty plain looking letters. They don't have all the fancy ornate serifs on them. Ariel, Verdana, and Calibri. And these are just examples. There are many other sans serif fonts. So this idea of serif and sans serif is an important distinction when thinking about what type of font. So you now know this answer. What font type styles make it easier to read? It's, of course, sans serif. Go to the third question. What font sizes? make a slide easier to read. So do you have a preferable font size that you've been using? I know I did. Turns out that 30 point in a number of studies is, is about the best. You can go a little smaller, 24 font. Because if somebody's on a very small smartphone, it's tough to see. And so you wanna provide uh, something that's going to be easily readable to them. If you go much smaller, it's, it's tough, depending on the screen size, the lighting, and so on. Of course, larger is fine. No problem there. So 
the research here in this area suggests that 30 font really makes the slide easier to read. It could be a little smaller, 24 or larger. So how many words make a slide easier to read? This is the fourth question. I'm asked this one a lot. Should it be 15 words, 20 words, or fewer or more? What's permissible? Well, this, this question has a really interesting answer. So I'll show you here a number, number three. So it's not three words, but rather three seconds. It's a little tricky answer. And so the, the answer to this question is, the number of words on a slide should be those that can be read in about three seconds. Could be four or five seconds, but the idea is fewer words on a slide. And this principle comes from a completely different area. This just fascinates me. It comes from the area of the transportation. If you and I are driving down the road and we're going to look at a sign along the road, do we want to be looking at that sign for 15 or 20 seconds? No, we'd be taking our eyes off the road when we're driving. Instead, we want to glance at the sign. So the sign needs to communicate quickly in about three or four seconds so we can move our eyes back on the road. The principle here is we, the speaker is the main focus. They're like the road. And the slide is like the sign along the side of the road. You want to just look at it, get the point, and come right back to the speaker. So I want to try a little experience with you, an experiment with you. I'm going to show you a sign for three seconds. See if you can read it, okay? This is a, a sign along the, the road here in the U.S. So here it is. One, two, three. Okay. Did you get the message of that slide? Yes. Okay. Let's go back to it. How many words are on the slide? One, two, three, four. Okay, four. And it has a picture of the air conditioner above with the cool air falling down. It does have text in the left and the right corner in the bottom, but it's kind of it's light text. It doesn't draw your eye right away. So if you're driving down the road, you could, with a glance test, you know, three or four seconds, you could get the message. It's the same idea when we're presenting. You'll notice my own slides here very few words. Okay? I want you to glance at them, but, but really I'm the communicator, I'm the speaker. Uh, and so uh, I want them to be like my backup singers and I'm the lead singer. Uh, Professor uh, Hartman, I'm sorry to cut yes. you in. Um, your time is uh, three to four minutes more. We, we have a lot of questions already. So, okay. yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I appreciate you uh, stepping in there. I did lose track of time a little bit. So I'm going to conclude uh, by suggesting one strategy that you can use with students. And I'm going to advance my slides here just a little bit to get to this. Thanks for your patience. The strategy or this activity is uh, really helps promote the use of the principles that I've talked about. And uh, this comes from a number of television shows that have become real popular in many parts of the world. And what they do is they emphasize the practice of makeovers, of taking one thing and making it over so it's better. And one of the shows that has been on for a long time in North America is where they make over houses. They'll go into a house that's maybe not in good repair and they'll fix it up. And they also do makeovers on people. They'll take their where they are, look currently and, and add makeup and clothing and so on and make them over. You could have your students, your colleagues do slide makeovers. And then in the process, they will, they will be using the the, uh, the principles for visual communication and see the transformation from what was into what will be. So I've taken uh, time today to talk about two things. Talk about this new oratory and 
talk about it in terms of setting and communicating. Uh, I think that these ideas are very applicable uh, to the work that you're doing now. It can be something you could use today or tomorrow in a small way and over time build and develop so that this new oratory is part of your repertoire of skills for communicating, especially now with digital technologies in a way that really facilitates uh, in a powerful way, uh, autonomy, uh, a new kind of autonomy in your communication. I wanna thank you very much for your attention and time. I hope this has been useful, uh, most of all, and I'd be glad to respond to questions and comments now. Thank you so much. All right, okay, that was a very interesting presentations that has already invited a lot of questions. So first I'm going to, uh, in on my note, there are about seven uh, uh, people who ask questions and three from Professor Bahruddin Mustafa, okay? Sure. I'm, go I'm going to read the first uh, uh, questions from uh, uh, Professor uh, Mustafa. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, some young researchers in Indonesia have been infatuated with the idea uh, with the idea of multimodal literacy in English as a foreign language. While the issue is current, it becomes a great concern in in our case because. The multimodal project is never discussed in, ela in, ela an, in an elaborate English because the students are accustomed to using non-verbal expression. Is there any suggestion, suggestion from your part as to how to encourage students to work with technology verbally? Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, to facilitate and promote greater verbal, verbal articulation when using technologies, <laughs> Uh, it, it behooves us, to, we need to take on the responsibility of helping them become familiar with the, the vocabulary and the terminology of using the digital technologies. Um, there are, you know, so, uh, had there been more time, um, I could have uh, talked a little bit about some, some of those terms. For example, there's a, there's a technique and multimodal and multimedia communication called progressive disclosure. And when I teach that to my students at both the undergraduate and graduate level, it, it, it is so helpful for them. It names something that helps facilitate their verbal communication about the technologies that they're using. And just in brief, progressive disclosure is when you show in uh, uh, Rather than show an entire slide at once, all the words on the slide, you show them sequentially. You show them step by step. And it can be done not only with words, but it can be done with diagrams. And I teach them how to conceal parts of a diagram on a slide and then slowly reveal each part of the diagram so that it helps learners, it helps an audience um, step by step come to understand something that you're that might be pretty complicated and sophisticated. So my point then again is we, had, we need to teach the vocabulary uh, and that uh, of using digital technologies specific for autonomy uh, purposes. And that vocabulary then helps facilitate their communication about what they're doing with the technologies. Good question, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is from uh, Astari. Um, how can teachers provide learning materials effectively so that students who are far from them can understand the lesson and there is mutual communication between teachers and students? Well, that's, that's always a big challenge. Uh, it's, it's, it's often a challenge when we're face-to-face, -face, but it's really amplified, uh, certainly when we're, we're doing things virtually. Um, through and through distance learning. So I can share with you a couple of things that I try and do. Um, one is that I create, um, uh, I, I, first of all, I partner students up with each other in my classes. Uh, so they're in small groups of three or four, and those are support groups. 
where if they have questions, they have things that are unclear, their first move should be to go to that small group and they should talk together and try and they can clarify for each other. And in that way, uh, that helps with some of the communication load that I might experience, especially if I have a lot of students. So uh, often they can answer questions for each other, whether it's about the technology, it's about the assignment, it's about some concept or idea uh, that's been a part of a lecture or a video. So I try and set up little peer support groups um, that uh, really help bring clarification and clear communication. Another thing I do is I set up open times when students can come by and just drop in virtually and talk with me. It could be about, you know, again, anything related to the course. Uh, and I just set a time, set aside a time each week when they can drop by virtually and talk with me. And then third, I often get questions that are sent to me in, in written form. And I create little tiny videos. They're called explainer videos. And in those, I, I explain something that hasn't been clear because uh, I'll get a couple of questions about it uh, through email or through chat. And so those explainer videos I then send out, uh, they're very short. Some of them are like 30 seconds, no longer than two minutes. And I'll often uh, post them also on our uh, learning management system. So those are a couple ideas of how I try and you know, really bridge and facilitate good communication at different levels. Okay, thank you. Um, the third question is again from uh, Professor Mustafa. Okay, um, uh, Pak Bahudin, Professor Mustafa, notice that uh, in the USA foreign language teaching is failing. Any comment in this issue? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I laugh because there's some there's truth to that, um, but I I, uh, I guess uh, I have another response too besides a laugh, and that is that <laughs> that um, it's it, you know if we say it's failing, it's not doing that everywhere. Uh, you know that's a gen to say that is it's a generalization. And there are really, there, in some places, there, there's very good foreign language teaching. Uh, I've seen it. And uh, uh, my children have experienced it. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's, uh, it would be fair to say that there's uneven quality in foreign language instruction. If I had to say... Um, Sort of drill a little deeper, I would say that one of the challenges that we face is that we start language, foreign language instruction so late in the development of our young people. Uh, often it's high school, you know, grade nine, before they're encountering their first language. Um, my son, for example, encountered his foreign language, his first language, uh, foreign language learning in kindergarten. So when he was five years old that's a better time to start. And so we need to really rethink the timing of it. And we also have to think about the pedagogy, pedagogies involved. I thought earlier when, when uh, Dr. Uh, Menden talked, uh, she had some really great ideas you know, about uh, uh, how it can be done more effectively and how we could learn uh, those effective ways. Okay, so move on. Okay, move on to the next questions. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one of the features of new oratory is informal staging. In your opinion, is it possible to have informal staging in Indonesia? Well, I have to uh, say that I don't know um, uh, the range of cultural practices that uh, are valued completely in Indonesia. Um, I think there's a place and a time for different forms of oratory. Uh, uh, a very casual and informal one that like I've talked about may not fit every situation, uh, every, every nation, every culture, every individual occasion. So uh, you might be a better uh, judge or, or uh, evaluator about whether it, it's, it, it's usable. If it's not usable in its entirety, uh, there may be small elements of it that are usable. It could mean that, for example, in a class, uh, 
uh, at a university that there could be a little more informality or, or casualness at times during the teaching and learning that's going on, but maybe not all the time. So that this is a case where I, I really presented uh, a strong argument for this, but each context, each individual, each occasion needs to really be thought about as to whether the new oratory in its entirety or just some elements of it uh, might be appropriate. Okay. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Hartman. The next question is, are there any personal tips for young students in this whole new oratory regarding skills and finding platforms? Well, um, yeah, I think that, uh, I think that you're referring to maybe students in school, maybe elementary school or in the middle years. Uh, you know, I, I watched one of my daughters, uh, and a teacher who did this very skillfully. Uh, she was very aware of the new oratories and she made it a lot of fun for the students uh, where they, they created slides, but you know, she, she really emphasized that you gotta think carefully about things like color, about font size, about the images you use and uh, the number of words. And uh, you know, the kids really picked up on it and developed some of the vocabulary around visual design and communication. And uh, they would learn to kind of critique each other's work in a fun way. And uh, it became very engaging. And, and they spent a lot of time uh, crafting uh, these tools for visual communication and then presenting it to peers in class. So I think there's a lot that can be done with young people. Okay, uh, thank you. Move on to the next questions from Ibu Yanti. Uh, she was concerned with the information overload in the all digital era and overwhelming cognitive and affective processes involved. In your opinion, where's the line? Where's too much is too much? Does anyone with much more information learn better and vice versa? So I, I, think, I think the question's about too much information and cognitive overload is that right yes okay so uh, the new the new oratory is um you know i hope i've modeled it well uh, I'm, this is something i'm still learning about and and trying to get better at but i think that the new oratory really values the principle of parsimony and and that is saying things simply at uh, saying that saying something that's really focused and not overloading uh, learners or an audience with information, whether that's visual or, you know, uh, or orally through, through listening. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as a, as a teacher and a presenter, we need to really be mindful of that, uh, that we can put too much on someone. Uh, I'm working with a number of countries right now, universities in several countries uh, at, at the university level. And, and, and it's been a real challenge to develop this awareness in faculty that you, you know something so well, but the, the students in your class are brand new to it and you can overwhelm them with information visually and orally. And so, uh, helping them pull back a bit on the amount of information, focus it and be clear on what's essential and then also what's peripheral. So, we, you know, the, the, uh, had we more time, I could show you a few examples. But thanks for that okay. question. Okay. Another question is from, uh, still from Barudin. I think uh, I will suggest him to directly contact you later on for you know a more fruitful discussion. I will move on into the next question first, yeah? From Pa Subandio. Okay, how do teachers raise awareness to the students about the importance of digital literacy, do you think? Well, um, gosh, there's, there are a number of different ways you can think about this. Uh, you know, in terms of the way I talked about it today, I think you can show, uh, this is how I start with, uh, with my students uh, and started with my own children even. I showed them two slides 
uh, one that was an original slide and one that had been made over. And I just said, which one's more understandable? And started asking questions. What is it that makes one more understandable than the other? What are, what are the features? What are the things on it that make it like jump right at you and you go, I got it, aha. And like sort of getting into that mindset that design matters when we communicate visually, that uh, it creates interest, it piques their interest. And when you do that, uh, that helps you know, pull students in and you can take them a step further and a little step further. It's important not to make big leaps, but to make those small steps. And uh, I, I hope today I modeled that by just posing those, those questions. They're, they're pretty basic questions. You know, what's font size? But in the end, if font size is too small and it's not readable, that really affects the learning experience, especially online. Okay, thank you. We still have plenty of time, everyone. So now I will invite anyone from the floor to directly ask questions to uh, uh, Professor Hatman. If you need some translation, I would be more than happy to do it for you. Okay, anyone, please, the floor. May I? Oh, may of I? course you may, Ibu. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Douglas, I'm very uh, expressed with your uh, presentation. I would like to ask you three minutes thesis. I did it already for my students, you know, in my public speaking class, but hey. it seems that it didn't work. It didn't oh. work at all, you know. It didn't work at all. Three minutes thesis, it's quite difficult for my students. What is your opinion about this? Thank you very much. Well, let me ask you a question before I respond. What is it that didn't work? So it is about the topic in public speaking, about the topic in the pu uh, public speaking. So three minutes is a very short time for them to think and to express it in their English, of course. It is. It's, it's a very short amount of time. So it, it does take quite a bit of support and scaffolding to help them think about what's essential, what's really essential, because you because the time frame is so tight. And not only what's essential, but how do you present it in a way that's interesting and engaging to others? And so you know, I think that the scaffolding has to think, has, has to focus on a couple of things. And one is what would be most interesting to the audience that's going to be hearing this? And that's that's a good place to start, you know. Who is your audience? What do they care about? What would they find fascinating about the study that you've done? And that might be the place to start in your three minutes is with that kind of curiosity that you pique uh, in your, your, your listeners. And then from there, you, you talk about a finding, maybe your only, one of your many findings, but it's a key finding that relates to that curiosity. And then Finally, at the end, you might give a little bit of information about how you collected the data, but it has to be very general. You, know, you might, in interviews, surveys, you know, just something quickly about those. And then at the end, you wrap it up with, how's this relevant? Why is it significant or important? And you have to allot time to each of those. It might only be 25 seconds you know, to some of them. And they have to rehearse, 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 rehearse so that it just becomes automatic. So the, the, in this format, those are some quick suggestions. I know it's really hard. I know it's really hard to say something in three minutes that you may have spent a year or two working on. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your okay. question. Uh, any more questions, everyone? Oh, just for your information, we hear we actually have the winner of three minute thesis presentation. Yeah, Ibu Ika was the winner of that such competitions when she was pursuing yeah. her, his uh, doctoral degree. Congratulations. Okay. That's terrific news. Thank you. Right. Anyone else uh, would like to ask questions? Um, please. Uh, before we or before we uh, come to the next question, Professor Douglas, uh, we have a message here from Papua who would like to invite you to visit Bandung when the pandemic was over, is over, hopefully. Yes, yeah, so you can have a better time here later on. 
Oh, that's very kind. I would welcome that. Uh, that would be very special. Uh, and I, please, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that invitation. All right, everyone, we still have time, please. Again, if you need some translations, I will be more, more than happy to do it for you if you ask questions in Bahasa Indonesia. Okay. If no one is taking the floor, then I would, because we still have time, I would um, deliver uh, the next questions. Okay. Anyone? First? No. Okay. Um, another question from Pak Bahrudin here, uh, Professor Mustafa. Uh, language teaching and learning in classroom context is by and large filled with problems because both teachers and students have been taking second seat to official curriculum, less than clear direction in the documents. Would you share with us what happens in the foreign language teaching in the US schools or campuses? Well, there, there is variety in terms of what, what's taught and how it's taught. Um, what I know for the most part is uh, I've witnessed through my kids' own learning. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm monolingual and um, I, I wish I weren't. You know, I, I went through a school system that, that didn't, uh, didn't offer uh, the opportunity for me to study uh, uh, another language. Uh, when I was going through school. So, um, but, you know, largely it's somebody lecturing, uh, giving assignments, and then kids kind of going off and practicing, or supposedly practicing and trying things out on their own. And, and then their homework, they're, they're trying to memorize a lot of vocabulary. I would say that, that none of those in and of themselves uh, would be bad. You certainly have to memorize remember things and we need practice and it's good to hear somebody model the language well, but we need more than that. And we need it really contextualized and we need it authentic, whether it's uh, the interactions or whether it's the texts, the language texts we're working with. Uh, and we need plenty of opportunities to practice in both authentic and meaningful and enriching ways. Uh, and the input that we receive needs to be just right for us. Uh, it has to be comprehensible input. So there's so many things that I think we could do better in this country in our language teaching. And, uh, you know, uh, again, when, when Dr. Nenden was talking earlier, she really hit on, on some of those really key things. And so, uh, you know, I thought that, that she touched on that well. Uh, so that's a partial answer to your question. Uh, and it's limited because of my own experience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to invite one last questions, if any, anyone? Uh, I have a question. Sir. Yes, okay. Yeah. Start uh, to the question, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, nowadays we learn uh, online, we study online. Uh, we study through the video, the video or the media, like now, sometimes, we study through the through the Zoom meeting or else. So, um, what is what the what the teachers and students need to prepare so that communications during uh, this online learning can occur properly? Okay. Yeah, you have asked a very important question. Uh, there's no single answer, I think. It, it, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the content, the type of content that's being taught. I think that shapes, to a certain extent, what you end up doing instructionally. Uh, I think it also requires or depends on the skill of the teacher uh, or their comfort in using various types of technologies. And it, it really depends on uh, how students have been uh, mentored and brought along in using the technologies. Uh, so they, they have to know the routines and know how to use certain tools. So if those things are in place and workable, here are just a few ideas. I think, first of all, uh, we need to think about chunking or making smaller segments in our instruction. So when I work with students who are going to become teachers in my class, 
I might explain something, show something for five to 10 minutes. I have their, I know I pretty well have their attention for that, that time period. And then I, I have some activity that I have them do. It could be very brief. It could, I could just have them answer a question and they could do that to me in the chat or I could send them to breakout rooms um, or they could text each other because I have them use their phones to text each other during class. So I want to have back channel talk uh, also. So the, you know, that's one thing, sort of real small chunks or segments of, of learning about something, seeing something, witnessing it, and then trying it, experimenting or talking about it, and then coming back and then there's a little bit more of something to hear about, view, or so on, and then they have another activity. And, and I found that to be really effective to make smaller units in which there's more activity. And I usually end class with there being a kind of larger activity that really pulls together all the smaller pieces they've been learning about earlier in class. Now I have the advantage in that uh, I have students for a long period of time. Each, each time I meet with them. I have them for three hours. And so I can take that three hour block and I can chop it up into small little segments. And then at the end, the last hour, they're working on a project with each other. And usually it's in breakout rooms. And I'll drop into a room, see what's going on, listen to what they're doing, offer some feedback, and then I'll go to another breakout room. And then at the end of that hour, they're, they're committed to submit something. Uh, they have to hand it in. So it really keeps them on task and engaged with what's going on. So that's one model. It it's really fits well, I think, at the university level where students are more independent. Uh, they really want the kind of autonomy. They want to think about things with their, their classmates and peers. And you'd have to adapt that in some ways if you're working with children who are much younger. So thanks for your question. Okay. Really, a big Thanks. challenge for it uh, is to create the right strategies for the uh, students. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, that questions uh, ends these sessions. Thank you very much, everyone, for the questions. Uh, let's give us uh, let's give uh, Professor Hartman a big round of applause. Clap, clap, thank clap. Thank you very much, you. Professor uh, Hartman. That was a very insightful, interesting presentation. Uh, before we, before I hand over uh, the screen to the MC, let me quote Professor uh, Hartman's uh, words: "That we, as teachers and pro, uh, and lecturers, have the best profession in the world." Thank you very much. Okay, very Madu, uh, MC, the screen is yours. Hey, terima kasih. Uh, kepada Bapak Profesor Hartman dan Pak Budi yang sudah memandu acara uh, Hadirin yang kami hormati uh, Kita akan rehat sejenak Dan acara akan dilanjutkan kembali pada pukul 11 Namun sebelum itu, bagi hadirin yang belum mengisi daftar hadir Mohon dapat mengisi daftar hadir yang sudah disediakan panitia pada ruang obrolan Terima kasih okay, Ladies and gentlemen, the session will adjourn for about 5 minutes And we will begin the panel sessions at 11 and please, we'd like to kindly remind you that uh, you need to fill in the attendees uh, as shared in the chat. Thank you.
Baik, hadirin yang kami hormati, berapa saat lagi kita akan masuki sesi pembicara undangan. Hadirin dimohon dapat bersiap kembali. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, the panel session will start in a moment. And to all participants, please enter the main room. Thank you. Hadirin yang berbahagia, kita memasuki sesi pembicara undangan. Kami mempersilakan pada para pembicara undangan. Yang pertama, Bapak Dr. Mahmud Fasya SPDMA, Ibu Dr. Juju Juang si MPD, Ibu Dr. Halima MPD, serta Ibu Ika Lestari Damayanti MA PSD. Sesi ini akan dipandu oleh Bapak Ari Arifin Danuwijaya MED. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now come to panel session and we'd like to kindly invite the featured speakers, Dr. Mahmud Fasya MA, Dr. Juju Juang si MPD, Dr. Halima MPD, and Ika Lestari Damayanti MA PhD. This session will be chaired by Ari Arifin dan Wijaya MD. Okay, thank you, uh, the MC. Thank you for the chance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, staying with us uh, in this conference. And now we are coming to the uh, third agenda, which is the presentation from these uh, featured speakers. Uh, as mentioned by the MC, we have three, oh, sorry, four uh, speakers for this uh, session. Uh, allow me to introduce four speakers for today. Uh, the first one we have Dr. Mahmoud Fasya, MA. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud is a lecturer at the Department of Indonesian Language and Literature Education. Uh, his research interests are centered on linguistics, particularly in language, culture, and society. He has just completed uh, his dissertation entitled Time Expressions of Sundanese. I believe Dr. Mahmoud Fasha is here. Yes. Thank you for, join yeah, thank you for okay, joining thank us, you. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud. And then we have the second speaker, Dr. Juju Juangsi MPD. Uh, she is a lecturer at the Department of Japanese Language Education. She has 17 years of research, teaching, consulting, and community service experience in Japanese language education. She has also uh, long teacher training experiences funded by the Japan Foundation in 2003 and 2020, and Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology in Shizuoka University from 2006 to 2008. Her research interests are centered on Japanese language of tourism, Japanese reading, and Japanese grammar. Ibu Dr. Juju is here. Yes. Thank you for joining. And then we have the third speaker of today's session is Ibu Dr. Halima MPD. Uh, she is a lecturer at the Department of Indonesian Language and Literature Education. Her research interests are centered on uh, literary learning, particularly in fiction, prose learning. She has just completed her dissertation entitled The Uncertainty of Indonesian Short Stories and it's used as a literary appreciation enrichment book based on literacy dimensions for middle schools and colleges. Thank you for joining us, Ibu Dr. Halima. And then the last presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The last presenter uh, is Ibu Ika Lestari Damayanti, MA, PhD. Ibu Ika is Associate Professor in the Department of English Education. She earned her master's degree from University of Warwick, UK, and her doctorate degree from University of Wollongong, Australia. In recent years, she has conducted extensive research and workshops on EFL methodology, gender pedagogy, literacy, and storytelling. She has just published articles about storytelling, visual and verbal representation for gender construction, and multimodal literacy in picture books. In addition, she also has written papers centering around the online learning pedagogy, such as the use of social media and Flipgrid for emergency online teaching. I believe Ibu Ika is here. Thank you for joining us, Ibu Ika. Ladies and gentlemen, this session uh, is one hour, so I would like to 
invite the first speaker, uh, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Fasha, to give the presentation. So uh, I hope each presenter can give presentation 10 minutes max. And then after that, uh, all presentations are given. We're going to have the question and answer uh, session at the end. So to Dr. Mahmoud, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to say thank you for coming to my presentation. It's great to see you all. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mahmud Fasha, and I am from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in this presentation, we will discuss Sundanese time expression in the perspective of language and culture. I believe that humans are bound by space and time. Meanwhile, language is always attached to human life. So, like humans who are speakers, language is also bound by space and time. In the context of time, language usually records various activities of its speaker about time. Furthermore, language can also usually express time in two ways, lexically or grammatically. In the context of this study, Sundanese express time lexically through words, phrase, and clauses. More specifically, this paper describes the various meaning of the time expression in Sundanese as cultural phenomena show that arise based on the time expression. There are three literature reviews used in this study. First, in the perspective of anthropological linguistics, Foley says that to understand the language as a whole, we must pay more attention to broader linguistic behavior because the language lives in the domain of sociocultural life. Second, Palmer explains that ethnosemantics is the study of how a group organizes and categorizes the domain of knowledge that is close to their life and culture. Third, Wisbika states that the world solves the dimension of the way of life and reasoning of its users, so it has the potential to solve the culture of its users. This study used a theoretical approach to anthropological linguistics by utilizing an ethnographic model of communication. Technically, this research applies a qualitative method. In this study, researchers classify and analyze data structurally through testing techniques in the form of substitution, permutation, paraphrasing, and expansion. Next, the researcher interprets the values of local wisdom about the concept of time in Sundanese society. The researcher also concludes the cultural implications of these values. The results show that the Sundanese language has the features of time statements based on natural conditions, based on worship times, based on days, based on seasons, based on community conditions, based on rice fields, and based on planting time in the field. The pattern of statement of 
at that time show that the Sundanese always tried to keep up a harmony between humans and humans, between humans and nature, and between humans and their God. Time statement based on natural conditions. For example, Wan Chi Murag Chi Ibun. The morning dew drops time. Wan Chi Hanet Moyan. Sun bathing time in the morning. Time statements based on worship times. For example, Lohor, Zuhur prayer time, Bada Lohor, after Zuhur prayer time. Time statements based on days. For example, Kamari, yesterday, Poiye, today, Isukan, tomorrow. Time statements based on seasons. For example, Usum Hujan, rainy seasons, Usum Halodo, dry season. Time statements based on community conditions. For example, Usum Pachaklik, bed season, Usum Sasalad, pandemic season. Time statements based on rice fields, for example, usum tandur, planting seasons, usum panen, harvest season. Time statements based on planting time in the fields, for example, usum ngasuk, planting seasons in dry fields using asuk, usum ngored, Grass cleaning season by using correct. There are several conclusions from this presentation. First, in terms of culture, Sundanese people show high creativity in choosing time reference because their time reference represents various things. Then, the concept of time is not only construct through formal lingual construction, words, praise, and clauses, learn, but also involves everyday phenomena that are found and carried out. This is an important clue to understanding how Sundanese people perceive time. Finally, space and time, space as a time reference can be lost from the daily life of the speakers. In the end, the speakers can lose various expressions of time in their language. Okay, thank you very much for your great attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Fahmud. Uh, Fasha for the presentation about time expression in Sudanese. This is very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe you have some questions uh, to Dr. Mahmoud Fasha, but, but keep it until uh, all the presenters have presented uh, the papers and we're moving later on to the question and answer session. Now I would like to invite the, spec, uh, the second speaker, Ibu Dr. Juju Juangsi. Okay, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you all today, and I'd like to say thank you for you coming to my presentation. My name is Juju Juangsi. I am from Japanese Language Education Department of UP. Today, I'd like to present my research paper regarding student perception on Japanese language teaching material develop within tourism context by using content and language integrated learning approach. Ladies and gentlemen, we all understand that one major importance for worker in tourism industry is the mastery of foreign language. Therefore, the implementer of tourism education must equip students with competence in using foreign language 
for their future. And create students with language proficiency to make them skilled in their working as they graduate. In relation to this, Japanese language instructor in the study program of tourism marketing management of UFI developed Japanese language teaching material for tourism. This development is because the previous material are more focused on the reading and writing of hiragana and katakana letters. So the material is not communicative. Meanwhile, in the development of the new material, the focus is on communication practices in Japanese in tourism setting. The approach used in its development is content and language integrated learning, in which the material are taught and at the same time learning deeply the language used in the learning. Kyle uh, 2010, Okuno 2018, called it learning with language, not learning language. And so in the course, of Japanese language introduction for tourism, students learn the content of tourism in Japanese language. The development of the Japanese language material for tourism in the course of Japanese language introduction for tourism is illustrated through this chart. This, the theme consists of six chapters, namely guidance, check-in, room facility, tourist information, souvenir shop, and restaurant. Meanwhile, the structure of each chapter consists of learning outcome, brainstorming, learning of four skills, and include pronunciation practice, knowledge on vocabulary and phrases, grammar, culture knowledge, and practice example of JLPT N5, at the end of the material. Here are some examples of the materials. Some literature used as references in this research include theories regarding language teaching materials development from Tomlinson, 2016, Japanese language for tourism from Okabe, 2013, Japanese for specific purposes from Iwata, 2009, while those for Korea are from Koileto, 2010 and from Okuno 2018. Whereas GLPT information is taken from a link, namely glptonline.org.id. The study used descriptive qualitative method. The research setting was in the study program of tourism marketing management of UPI from February to July 2018 involving students of tourism marketing management study program academic year 2017-2018 as the respondent. The study revealed that students think the material contents are aligned with the needs. However, the topic learned are still late. Students want addition in the topic and more detail within each topic. Of the four skills learned in the material, speaking gets the largest portion. Align the student, one, as they are guided to practice more on pronunciation and speaking using vocabulary and phrases of Japanese language in tourism context with their friend in a role play. Vocabulary and phrases, grammar and culture knowledge strengthen student understanding on the material. The addition of practice on JLPT is one particular of the material made from, for students who learn Japanese previously in cross places. It is expected that students can be assisted 
by trying to practice in JLPT and five. Here are the flow of learning in Japanese language material for tourism. It is started with sub chapter, continued with learning target, brainstorming, listening skill, pronunciation, vocabulary and phrases, language structure, speaking skill, reading skill, writing skill, Japanese culture, and the end of the book, there are practices of JLVT and five. The presentation can conclude seven aspects. First, students can learn Japanese language and content regarding tourism at the same time. Second, communication ability is the main focus. Third, student Japanese language ability improve. Four, student understanding on Japanese culture improve. Fifth, required to be practiced directly on spot. Six, need addition on relevant topic. And the last one, need cooperation with stakeholders to gain more beneficial material. Finally, here are references used for the study. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to answer your question in Indonesian language. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ibu Juju, for the presentation. That was really interesting. Investigating how uh, students perceived the Japanese teaching material in tourism. Uh, okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you have any question, um, be patient. We're going to have question and answer at the end of uh, this session after all the presenters have presented the papers. I would like to invite Ibu Dr. Halima as the third speaker to present the papers. Ibu Dr. Halima, yeah, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear leaders of the Faculty of Language in Literature, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to present the results of my research in this special forum. Dear scholars, thank you for attending and listening to my presentation. In this opportunity, I will briefly describe the results of my research about modern Indonesian short stories in a didactic literature review. The background of research is the importance of develop high value literature. This can be done by building the quality of society literature appreciation through teaching, socializing, and environment. So there is a need for studying and selecting the literary didactic materials. One of them is through didactic research activities on modern Indonesian short stories. Here is literature review that I use in this research. Regarding short stories, I have used several research by Abram and Harfam, Hasanuddin et al. and Stanton. Regarding digestic literature, I have used the research by Abram and Harfam, The Last Quest, South Harry, and Swando. Regarding digestic literature indicators, I have used the research by Abram and Harfam, Sumarjo, Sumiadi et al. and Rohulo. The research method I use it is the mixed method, which refers to the opinion of Sang, Creswell, Sugiono, and Gol et al. with the transformation sequential strategy design. In the quantitative section, I collected the data from Indonesian short story. Then I determined the research sampling using the multi-stage sampling technique. That is, 
purposive sampling, quota sampling, and probability sampling. In the qualitative section, I analyze the didacticness of Indonesian short stories based on the content analysis method. The result of quantitative research saw that the data of Indonesian short stories from the period of 1920 to 2020 were recorded as many as 16,427 titles. The high short stories productivity was in the period of 1953 to 1960 with a average annual productivity of 520 titles. The most productivity author from the entire periodization of literature is Seno Gumira Ajidharma with a number of 236 short stories that he had written. Beside that, Based on the qualitative analysis, I have discovered that Indonesian short stories contain didactism content. I found that 5.56% of the short stories has a didactic literary design, which is the way of expression and the very didactic expression. Moreover, it was found that 33.32% of Indonesian short stories have a category containing didactic expression. In this case, there is a didactic problem and solution. The most dominant is the Indonesian short stories categorized as containing didactic element or display didactic phenomena only, which amount to 61.11%. This is an example of an excerpt from the Indonesian didactic short story that describes the national ideology. Have a good time watching.
let's come to the conclusion. The conclusion of this research is, as a whole, the didacticness of Indonesian short stories contain Indonesian characteristic. All didactic elements, including religious aspect, moral aspect, social aspect, ideological aspect, and knowledge aspect, have the suitability with the characteristic of the region and the characteristic of the Indonesian population. Here are some of the references that I have cited. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Dr. Haliba, for the presentation about Indonesian short stories, didactical literature review. It's very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we've come to the last speaker of this session, Ibu Dr. Ika Lestari Damayanti, PhD. Yes, okay, the screen you. is yours, Ibu Ika. Thank you, Pak Ari. Uh, could you please uh, share screen my, my slides I, that I have sent earlier? Yeah. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My topic today is about a contextually sensitive professional learning model, which based on my PhD study is potential to bridge the divide between the program and practice in the language classroom, particularly English as a foreign language. Before I talk about what and why contextually sensitive program, let me share with you what I commonly heard from English teachers in Indonesia about their professional development experiences. Yes, next slide. Yes, thank you. So one teacher said that um, I learned a lot of interesting techniques from the workshop but I don't think I can apply them in my classroom. And another teacher said, it's fun. I mean, the workshop is fun, even though I don't really understand. So probably it sounds familiar, Ibu Bapak. What does it mean? <laughs> A number, yes, the next slide, please. A number of studies on professional learning consistently underscore the discrepancy of professional learning program and classroom realities in the context of in the context of teaching English as a foreign language. Some factors are responsible for this situation. This study reported that in the EFL context, professional program tends to be implemented in one short traditional model of knowledge transmission. And if we can see that uh, typically what is being delivered in the professional learning program uh, is theories or principles and general improvement pedagogic strategies. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so genre pedagogy is one of the approach applied in uh, Indonesia and as any other pedagogic framework for English language teaching has been developed in language settings a long way from most EFL situations. If we look at these three concentric cycle, circles of English, these frameworks have been developed in countries categorized as the inner circle, such as Australia, USA and UK. To implement these frameworks in the expanding circles, such as Indonesia, of course requires recontextualization or negotiation because English language classroom in the inner circle and expanding circles have different features. For example, teachers in the inner circle are most likely native speakers of English and students in this context are immersed in English speaking communities and typically they already have good command in uh, spoken language. In the expanding circle, on the other hand, most English teachers are non-native speakers who sometimes are not confident with their proficiency and students are generally in the process of learning spoken English as well as uh, their written language with limited exposure other than their English lesson or their English teachers. Yeah. Next slide. Now let's take a look at English language teaching in the Indonesian context, ladies and gentlemen. 
the 2030 English curriculum is informed by holiday systemic functional theory and its associated scaffolded pedagogy, the genre pedagogy, or in Indonesia known as genre-based approach. The adoption of the functional uh, theory is intended to better support Indonesian students' development of English language through the engagement with a range of text types, including reports, procedures, and narrative for story genres. Within this new curriculum, the learning process is expected to be student-centered, interactive, and active. Yeah. Next, uh, let me briefly explain language model according to systemic functional theory. So in this theory, there is a close relationship between context and language use. Uh, language is defined as a tool for people to interact with each other in exchanging meaning in a range of uh, different social contexts. So language is used to meet uh, various social purposes within a cultural context and it is realized as genres or text types. Yeah. Next. So in responding to the current situation of English language teaching in Indonesia, next slide please. My study uh, investigates uh, the ways EFL teachers in Indonesian lower secondary schools can be supported through a language-oriented professional learning program. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, this program is aimed at developing teachers' knowledge about language and literary texts, including their pedagogical application. Next slide. This study was conducted in two phases, or actually three phases. The first is the contextual analysis, but I will focus on these two phases for this presentation. The first one is um, the workshop and also classroom practices where the teachers, the participant teachers and researchers collaboratively plan, implemented and reflected on the teaching and learning process based on what the teachers have learned in the workshop. Yeah, next slide. So the model I developed based on the findings as a result of professional learning intervention uh, that I conducted in my study. So the model owes much to the functional model of language uh, presented earlier. The practices captured in the model resonate strongly with the text and context relationship described in the functional model. Um, approaching teaching and learning as discourse I argue uh, that changes in teacher behavior that impact on student outcomes are a result of their participation in situations that are shaped by activities, the relationship between participants, and the nature of the meaning-making resources at hand. Such situations are always shaped by context, both local and a broader social media. Uh, or the immediate context, so both local and broad uh, context, broader context. All right, the next slide. In the professional learning model proposed here, context is categorized into a wider social cultural context and a professional learning context. Elements of the broader level include national curriculum and examination system and ELT methodology and prevailing, uh, prevailing theories. So these are quite predictable elements. Click one more time, please. Yeah. What about the immediate context? So three tenets identified from the findings that contribute to immediate or local context, uh, which is conducive to professional learning are first, the degree of support from school leaders and professional learning communities. And the second one, the nature of teacher and external expertise and the available time for professional learning. Right, next. Um, so far, we have seen how contextual elements potentially affect teacher learning experiences. In the proposed model, teacher learning experiences are described as situations that shape teachers' growth in knowledge and skills through formal training, like the workshop, and followed up in their uh, classroom practices or situated learning in their own classroom. Three pedagogic register variables play important roles in, this, in the design and delivery of learning experiences. First, pedagogic activities that are heavily related to the curriculum content, as well as stages of classroom uh, 
activities. And second, second one, a pedagogic relation that deal with interaction in the class, be it offline or online, individual or group, uh, group work. And lastly, pedagogic modalities, whether using Zoom, learning apps, or as simple as WhatsApp group. All right, the next slide. Uh, to put all layers of the model together, we can see that in the broader context, the examination system, the national curriculum and its underpinning theories embody regulating elements. While these contextual elements tend to be certain and predictable, it is at the local level that the contextual variables are more dynamic. This context impact on the alignment of teacher learning experiences in the professional program and learning experiences they provide for their students in the classroom. Yeah, next one. So in one context, uh, time required for professional learning may need to be extended or truncated depending on whether support from organiz organizational executive and the quality of interaction between the expert and participating teachers are high enough or not. This means that the configuration of these variables can be different from one context to another. So understanding the dynamics of this configuration is imperative to ensure that learning experiences adjusted to local situation that take place. All right, uh, next. Uh, okay, so by observing important elements in designing and implementing a contextually sensitive professional learning program, I may conclude and I'm optimistic that we all can narrow the gap between what is offered in the professional learning program and teachers' classroom realities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ibu Ika, for the presentation about a co contextually relevant professional uh, learning model. It's really uh, engaging. Ladies and gentlemen, now we've come up to the uh, question and answer session. So if you would like to ask questions to um, Ibu uh, Ika or Ibu Dr. Halima, Ibu Juju or uh, Bapak Mahmud Fasha, I will give uh, the time. We have around 20 minutes for question and answer. If you don't want to ask straight away to the speaker, uh, you can use the chat box down there and then write the questions and I'm going to give it to the presenters. Anyone would like to ask questions? Okay, there's one question in the chat box coming from Tini. To Dr. Mahmoud uh, Fasha, based on the Sundanese time expression in the perspective of language and culture, are there certain times related to Sundanese culture, such as Pamali or so on in, in, in Sundanese culture? Berdasarkan uh, ekspresi waktu dalam bahasa Sunda yang disampaikan oleh Bapak uh, Mahmoud tadi, uh, ekspresi waktu dalam perspektif bahasa dan budaya. Adakah uh, certain times atau waktu tertentu uh, yang berkaitan dengan budaya Sunda seperti Pamali atau yang lainnya dalam budaya Sunda? Mangga Pak Mahmud. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Uh, Kang Ari sebagai moderator sudah membantu saya supaya responsnya lebih cepat ya. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bahasa Indonesia. Saja. Iya, uh, nanti bisa di apa diinterpretasi oleh Kang Ari. Uh, tentu saja uh, pernyataan kala atau pernyataan waktu dalam bahasa Sunda ada beberapa di antaranya yang berkaitan dengan pamali karena memang ekspresi waktu itu kan memang melekat pada aktivitas sosial budaya dari masyarakat Sunda, termasuk dari penutur bahasa yang lain juga demikian. Misalnya eh, wanci apa eh, sanekala ya, atau sarupna nah, itu kan biasanya eh, identik dengan pamali eh, ketika anak-anak masih berkeliaran bermain di luar rumah. Eh, itu mereka disarankan untuk segera masuk ke rumah. 
pada wanci atau pada waktu itu uh, ya memang uh, apa pada masa lalu yang lebih efektif kan memang menggunakan mitos karena memang setting sosial budayanya uh, demikianlah yang cocok pada waktu itu nah jika dipahami dalam konteks kekinian ya mungkin itu kan uh, mengharapkan anak-anak supaya tertib dalam memanfaatkan waktu apalagi kan saat sholat maghrib kan lebih tepat jika digunakan untuk beribadah di dalam masjid atau di dalam rumah seperti itu nampaknya jadi dalam kajian sosial budaya yang berkaitan dengan ekspresi-ekspresi kebahasaan yang jauh lebih relevan adalah bagaimana mengangkat nilai-nilai kearifan lokal itu apa sih yang masih relevan dengan konteks kekinian karena tentu saja semuanya harus disesuaikan dengan kondisi sosial budaya masyarakat yang ada pada saat ini. Termasuk banyak juga kan peringatan yang dulu dikemas dengan mitos, misalnya pamali kalau masuk ke hutan larangan itu, nah pada masa kini kan itu disebut sebagai bagian dari kampanye penyelamatan lingkungan hidup sebetulnya. Hanya dikemasnya kan dengan bahasa mitos yang relevan dengan kondisi sosial budaya masyarakat pada masa itu. Atau pada masa kini juga sebagian masyarakat kita yang ada di pelosok, yang di kampung-kampung adat masih uh, memahami itu, masih menerima itu sebagai sebuah kearifan lokal yang tetap dipertahankan sampai saat ini. Termasuk tentang tadi ekspresi yang berkaitan dengan waktu. Itu, uh, silakan Kang Ari. Ya, baik, uh, terima kasih Pak Mahmud. Jadi Pak Mali itu juga berkaitan dengan waktu ya. Contohnya tadi uh, main sore-sore gitu untuk anak kecil ya. ya betul. Pak Mali, baik terima kasih. Uh, ini kepada Dini, uh, mudah-mudahan tadi bisa dipaham ya dan tidak perlu saya interpretasikan lagi Pak Mahmud. Silahkan Bapak-Ibu bagi yang ingin bertanya kepada para presenter boleh menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. Boleh di chat atau boleh langsung silahkan. Saya tidak bisa melihat apakah ada yang mengangkat tangan. Uh, di sini atau boleh dituliskan di chat kalau tidak ada yang mengangkat tangan untuk bertanya lebih langsung boleh bapak ibu tuliskan pertanyaan di kolom chat Baik, ada pertanyaan dari Ibu Astari Mirisha, salah satu presenter, ingin bertanya kepada Ibu Juju, bagaimana cara guru atau dosen melihat dan mengimbangi pemahaman siswa terkait budaya kebahasaan Jepang itu saat kebanyakan siswa kita masih belum familiar dengan bahasa tersebut? Silakan Ibu Juju, eh, boleh langsung direspon. Baik, terima kasih atas pertanyaan, pertanyaannya dari Saudara Astari Mirisha. Uh, Mudah-mudahan saya bisa menjawab pertanyaan dari uh, Ibu. Uh, berkenaan dengan uh, pemahaman siswa terkait uh, budaya Jepang, uh, dalam hal ini uh, pada saat saya uh, membuat uh, materi ajar, dengan menggunakan pendekatan CLIL, yaitu bahwa materi ajar eh, yang dibuat itu, eh, kontennya itu nanti kan di situ bersentuhan dengan budaya Jepangnya. Nah, pada saat diajarkan itu eh, kita sekaligus mengajarkan budayanya. Mengajarkan bahasa Jepangnya, mengajarkan budayanya juga. Contohnya, misalnya ketika... Eh, di awal bab itu ada uh, perkenalan diri introduction itu di situ tidak hanya uh, bahasanya saja yang diajarkan tetapi bagaimana cara orang Jepang ketika memperkenalkan diri misalnya uh, bagaimana posisi badannya ada namanya OGD cara membukukan badan misalnya saya terangkan juga Uh, kalau untuk uh, misalnya uh, atasan itu 
berapa derajat misalnya kalau untuk orang yang uh, biasa saja atau orang yang baru kita kenal misalnya berapa derajat itu cara membukukan badannya itu sampai di situ saya ajarkan juga sehingga tidak hanya bahasanya saja uh, mahasiswa juga diberi pemahaman bahwa ketika kamu menggunakan ungkapan atau kata ini kamu harus bersikap seperti apa sehingga di pertemuan berikutnya itu pada saat mereka latihan role play itu mereka uh, secara langsung uh, mempraktekkan uh, hal tersebut. Jadi mereka mempraktekkan bahasanya juga mempraktekkan bagaimana uh, mereka melakukan uh, ucapan tersebut. Itu berkenaan dengan budayanya. Mungkin itu sedikit uh, contoh yang bisa saya berikan. Ada co banyak contoh yang lainnya juga. Terima kasih. Terima, Terima kasih Ibu Juju atas responnya. Uh, ada yang akan bertanya langsung? Ibu Rita Sujiati Johan, silakan Bu, dipersilakan untuk bertanya langsung kepada ya, siapa. Ya, terima kasih. Ya. Terima kasih, dengar suara saya ya, maaf. Ya, ya, kepada terdengar. Ibu Ika, kepada Ibu Ika, Ibu Ika tadi dalam pemaparannya dikatakan bahwa professional learning uh, is dependent upon so many things, so many points, ya. Saya membaca itu. Bagaimana Ibu menyiasatinya karena kenyataannya yang poin-poinnya itu sulit dilakukan Ibu. Yang kejadian keadaan sekarang ini. Hanya ingin tanggapan dari Ibu bagaimana menyiasatinya sudah training dan sebagainya tapi masih belum melakukan itu begitu Ibu. Terima kasih Ibu tanggapannya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Ibu Rita. Kasih. Uh, memang awal dari uh, yang memotivasi saya untuk melakukan penelitian itu karena ber, uh, beranjak dari situ justru permasalahannya sudah dikasih apapun di training pas di kelas balik lagi seperti itu gitu ya apalagi sekarang uh, selama pandemi dan ini sekalian dari Pak Darsono ada dari kon, di kontes ke PPG ini bagaimana gitu ya karena kebetulan saat ini saya juga sedang uh, uh, apa berpartisipasi di program PPG juga jadi uh, sebetulnya tadi poin-poin yang yang ingin saya sampaikan yang di highlight adalah di bagian Uh, immediate context atau local context dan itu akan sangat berbeda-beda ketika membimbing mahasiswa S1 yang PPL atau uh, yang PPG gitu ya itu uh, memiliki karakteristik yang berbeda-beda uh, kalau misalnya tadi yang konteks lebih luasnya itu relatif di Indonesia itu sama semua karena pasti mengikuti kurikulum dan uh, teori yang memang digaungkan oleh pemerintah tapi ketika pelaksanaan pelatihan ini yang akan berbeda-beda kadang ada yang uh, kepala sekolah atau pimpinannya mendukung dia mengikuti pelatihan di hari-hari kerja hari sekolah ada juga yang tidak uh, di weekend itu juga sangat mempengaruhi keseriusan para, uh, para peserta pelatihan itu kemudian ini memang jadi tantangan yang besar buat teacher educatorsnya gitu ya. E, harus bisa melihat berbagai macam e, kondisi yang dihadapi oleh para participants di dalam trainingnya itu. E, misalnya ada yang kalau tadi pas di plenary speaker Ibu Nenden menyebutkan ada sampai siswa yang harus naik ke tangga atau pergi ke bukit untuk mencari sinyal. Demikian juga dengan guru-guru yang mengikuti PPG. Dan saya kira di sini kita sebagai teacher educators memang harus bisa lebih luas lagi, pengetahuannya lebih open-minded dan mau mendengarkan apa yang para guru ini hadapi di sekitar mereka dan bersama-sama mencarikan solusinya dicari jalan tengah. Sehingga dengan kondisi yang sekarang, apalagi di Indonesia dengan berbagai macam situasi yang sangat beragam dari yang high-tech sampai ke low-tech, <laughs> low technology, itu memang kitanya juga jadi... Uh, negosiasinya jadi panjang sekali gitu. Jadi untuk satu grup PPG saja saya bisa misalnya uh, require uh, apa uh, expecting some teachers to use some learning apps uh, for their teaching gitu ya. Tapi di sisi lain juga tidak karena mau pakai learning apps yang fancy dan flashy gitu tapi kenyataannya buat WhatsApp aja kuotanya sering tersendat gitu ya. Jadi memang ini kita sebagai teacher educatorsnya uh, harus uh, apa harus open minded dan uh, 
terbuka saja karena memang um, jangan sampai berpikir itu tadi transmission knowledge-nya itu one way karena sebetulnya teacher educators juga bisa berkolaborasi dengan guru gitu ya bahwa guru juga memiliki knowledge yang tidak dimiliki oleh teacher educators misalnya bagaimana menghadapi anak-anak yang harus uh, lari ke gunung dulu untuk mencari buat saya saya tidak tahu sama sekali situasi seperti itu bagaimana gitu dan saya bisa belajar dari guru-guru yang menghadapi siswa di, di daerah-daerah seperti itu uh, jadi memang yang perlu diperhatikan tadi di konteks itu dan uh, selain itu adalah yang kedua yang penting dan ini sedang saya pikirkan juga uh, apa bagaimana pelaksanaannya tetapi justru dengan adanya online ini malah jadi memungkinkan yaitu setelah workshop itu jangan berhenti di workshop jadi teacher educator itu turun sama-sama ke sekolah dan saya kira PPG sudah melakukan ini juga gitu ya bahwa uh, ada guru pamong dan uh, dosen yang membimbing mereka ke kelas jadi ketika uh, apa uh, ketika menyusun RPP-nya gitu ya, ketika melakukan implementasi itu guru dan teacher educators itu bekerja sama. Jadi kalau di penelitian saya yang saya lakukan, uh, saya tidak hanya mengamati apa yang guru itu lakukan, tapi ketika dibutuhkan saya juga akan step in dan kadang saya juga perlu memberikan model kepada guru karena nanti guru gini, ibu gampang ngomong kayak gitu gitu, ya. coba nih dengan siswa saya bisa nggak ibu? Karena nggak ada tantangan seperti itu. Jadi uh, teacher educator juga kadang suka dianggap jumawa oleh para guru, belum tentu dia akan kalau ngajar di kelas saya bisa mengimplementasikan metode itu. Jadi memang ini harus bekerja bersama-sama antara teacher educators yang memiliki pengetahuan yang lebih luas berdasarkan hasil penelitian untuk bisa membantu guru bagaimana menegosiasikan apa yang diharapkan di broader konteks untuk bisa sesuai dengan uh, local situation. Seperti itu Ibu Rita. Ya, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih Ibu Rita atas pertanyaan. Ibu Ika, terima kasih. Ada satu pertanyaan, masih ada dua pertanyaan sebenarnya, tapi izinkan saya ke Ibu Halimah dulu. Ini ada pertanyaan dari Ibu Rahma Fauziah, Ibu Halimah. Di chat izin bertanya kepada Ibu Halimah, dihubungkan dengan pembelajaran resensi sastra, apakah harus dilengkapi oleh pemilihan cerpen sesuai dengan kriteria khusus Ibu? Terima kasih Pak Ari. Terima kasih juga kepada penanya Neng Rahma ini mahasiswa kami ya semester 7 ya tentu saja ya Rahmah dalam pembelajaran sastra apresiasi sastra baik itu resensi sastra membuat eh, apa menulis struktur sastra begitu ya ataupun dalam mengkonstruksi sastra pemilihan cerpen untuk anak-anak kita harus eh, dilengkapi dengan kriteria khusus terutama kriteria-kriteria yang berhubungan dengan pemilihan sastra didaktis dan sastra unggulan. Nah, untuk pemilihan sastra unggulan, silakan buka BNSP tahun 2019 ya. Nah, itu sudah ditentukan oleh eh, Badan Standar Nasional karya sastra-karya sastra unggulan yang bisa kita pilih untuk anak-anak didik kita. Ya, selamat berkarya Rahma. Sudah menjadi presenter juga ya dalam uh, ikolat ini. Terima kasih. Baik, Baik terima, terima kasih, kasih Bu Juju. Ya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Rahma telah bertanya. Ini pertanyaan terakhir tampaknya, karena waktu kita tersisa lima menit lagi. Pertanyaan terakhir kepada Bapak Mahmud, ada di chat dari Bapak okay. Jaya Kusuma. Apakah kearifan lokal relevan dengan kurikulum di Indonesia? Sementara ada persepsi bahwa kebudayaan dan tradisi yang memang menjadi dasar dari etnopedagogik tidak begitu penting dan dianggap ketinggalan zaman. Bagaimana sikap Bapak dalam hal ini? Ya, terima kasih luar biasa. Ini uh, pertanyaan yang mantap karena relevan juga dengan apa konteks pendidikan ya. Jadi mengaitkan kajian bahasa dan budaya dengan uh, konteks pendidikan kita. <tuh> uh, <tuh> uh, justru memang uh, Sejauh ini para peneliti bahasa dan budaya eh, terus menunjukkan kontribusinya dalam konteks kajian-kajian kekinian yang memang salah satunya diharapkan bersentuhan dengan penyelesaian masalah-masalah yang ada dalam isu-isu SDGs. Nah, termasuk saya membuktikannya misalnya lewat eh, bimbingan penelitian mahasiswa dalam konteks program kreativitas mahasiswa. Bagaimana kajian sosial budaya juga relevan dengan penyelesaian isu-isu SDGs. Salah satunya memang melibatkan kearifan lokal dalam menyelesaikan masalah lingkungan hidup misalnya, termasuk menyelesaikan masalah-masalah pendidikan. 
uh, yang salah satunya disebut juga oleh penanya tentang uh, prinsip etnopedagogi. Uh, dalam konteks lingkungan hidup misalnya itu jauh lebih banyak uh, yang pernah saya ungkap misalnya dalam beberapa riset terdahulu bahwa ternyata uh, pelibatan uh, kearifan lokal dalam pembangunan yang berkelanjutan, dalam pembangunan yang memastikan berbagai aspek itu j- sangat dibutuhkan dalam konteks kekinian. Uh, misalnya dalam membangun sebuah waduk atau bendungan misalnya, di daerah saya di Jati Gede misalnya, itu tidak bisa lepas dari aspek kearifan lokal. Kalau pembangunannya mengabaikan aspek kearifan lokal, maka tentu saja akan banyak terjadi reaksi uh, uh, apa kemarahan dari masyarakat sekitar. Nah ini pun yang terjadi di daerah saya misalnya, itu sudah menggandeng kearifan lokal, gitu. walaupun dalam uh, mungkin batas-batas yang minimal karena memenuhi SOP misalnya. Namun setidaknya itu dapat meminimalkan konflik yang bisa terjadi yang jauh lebih besar. Nah, itu diantaranya. Jadi, uh, uh, apa yang menyebutkan bahwa kearifan lokal itu tidak relevan atau tidak sesuai dengan konteks kurikulum di Indonesia, uh, tentu mungkin itu hanya melihat uh, aspek-aspek uh, kecil dari kearifan lokal itu. Karena memang juga saya sependapat, uh, tidak semua kearifan lokal memang relevan dengan konteks kekinian. Maka yang perlu dilakukan adalah transformasi, Re, redefinisi, misalnya reaktualisasi, seperti itu. Pengemasan ulang kearifan lokal itu agar relevan dengan kondisi kekinian. Karena tadi saya mengatakan dalam pertanyaan sebelumnya, bahwa setting sosial budaya masyarakat kita juga bergeser. Kalau dulu dominasinya lewat mitos itu relevan, cocok, karena setting sosial budaya masyarakatnya seperti itu, Nah, dalam konteks kekinian, semakin rasional masyarakat, maka pengemasan kearifan lokal juga harus disesuaikan dengan kondisi masyarakat yang makin rasional itu. Itu, uh, Kang Ari, terima kasih untuk penanya. Baik, terima Silahkan. kasih Pak Dr. Mahmud, luar biasa hmm. jawabannya, dan memang sangat-sangat terkait erat antara budaya dengan uh, pendidikan, begitu ya, terutama budaya Sunda yang tadi disampaikan di awal, terkait dengan time expression, itu juga... Uh, sangat-sangat menarik. Uh, Bapak-Ibu, waktu sudah menunjukkan pukul 12, tampaknya saya harus mengakhiri. Sebelum saya akhiri, kita berikan aplaus, tepuk tangan <tuh> yang sangat meriah, boleh secara virtual, kepada Bapak-Ibu yang telah menjadi presenter pada sesi uh, yang telah selesai ini. Saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada Bapak Dr. Mahmud Fasha, terima kasih. Kemudian Ibu Dr. Juju Juangsi, terima kasih Ibu. Uh, Ibu Dr. Halimah juga terima kasih telah berbagi. Dan terakhir ke- kepada Ibu Ika Lestari Damayanti PhD, terima kasih uh, Bapak-Ibu. Uh, Bapak-Ibu uh, hadirin mudah-mudahan uh, paparan dari para presenter tadi bisa memberikan uh, wawasan karena ini luar biasa menarik dengan empat latar belakang atau topik yang berbeda mulai dari bahasa Sunda, bahasa Indonesia, bahasa Jepang, dan juga terkait dengan uh, konteks professional learning kepada guru-guru pendidikan bahasa Inggris. Mudah-mudahan ini bisa memberikan manfaat untuk kita semua. Terima kasih, saya undur diri. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih kepada para pembicara undangan yang sudah mempresentasikan makalanya. Dan terima kasih juga kepada Bapak Ari yang sudah memandu acara sesi pembicara undangan. Baik, hadirin yang berbahagia. Kita akan memasuki rehat siang sekitar satu jam. Setelah rehat, seminar akan memasuki sesi paralel. Namun sebelum itu, akan ada beberapa pengumuman yang akan kami sampaikan. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a break for about one hour. And after the break, the conference session will continue to a parallel session. But before we have a break, we'd like to remind you some important information. Panitia akan memilih tiga pemakalah terbaik dan tiga peserta terbaik yang akan diumumkan di akhir acara. Silakan hadirin dapat berpartisipasi aktif dalam setiap sesi seminar. At the end of the parallel session, the committee will select the best presenters and best participants, and the award will be given to three persons for each category. Semua pemakalah diharapkan dapat bergabung ke ruang paralel sesuai dengan pembagian ruang yang telah ditentukan oleh panitia 10 menit sebelum acara sesi paralel dimulai. All participants are expected to join each parallel session based on the room code 10 minutes before the session commences. 
Ruangan yang digunakan pada saat sesi paralel dapat dimasuki secara mandiri oleh para pemakalah maupun peserta. All presenters and participants may directly enter each parallel room. Pemakalah diberikan waktu 10 menit untuk mempresentasikan makalah dan 10 menit untuk sesi tanya jawab. Petugas penjaga ruangan akan memandu jalannya diskusi dan membantu menampilkan tayangan salindia dari para pemakalah. The presenter should deliver the presentation in 10 minutes with additional 10 minutes for Q&A session. A roomkeeper will lead the discussion and display it with PowerPoint slides. Dimohon tidak lupa untuk mengisi daftar hadir yang akan dibagikan oleh petugas penjaga ruangan melalui ruang obrolan. Please do not forget to fill in the attendance form which will be shared by the roomkeeper in each room via chat room. Para pemakalah dimohon tetap berada di ruangan masing-masing sampai sesi paralel berakhir. Untuk selain pemakalah, silakan dapat berpindah ke ruangan yang berbeda sesuai dengan yang dikehendaki. To the presenter, please remain in the same breakout room during parallel session discussion. And to the participants, you are coming to remain in the same breakout room. However, if you wish, you may also leave and enter a different breakout room. Apabila Anda mengalami masalah sekaitan dengan teknis masuk ke ruang paralel, silakan Anda dapat menyampaikan masalah tersebut kepada panitia dengan menuliskan pesan di ruang obrolan. Should you have problems to enter the breakout room, please do not hesitate to ask for assistance from the committee through chat room. Kami ingatkan juga kepada semua partisipan untuk mengisi formulir keikutsertaan dan evaluasi secara daring untuk mendapatkan sertifikat. Tautan formulir akan disampaikan melalui ruang obrolan setelah sesi paralel selesai. We also like to remind you that you will need to fill out the exit ticket to get the certificate, and the link will be shared at the end of parallel session. Kepada para pemakalah, mohon untuk mengunggah artikel melalui sistem dengan mengikuti titik mangsa berikut. Batas akhir pengunggahan makalah lengkap 19 Agustus 2021. Batas akhir pembayaran biaya publikasi 19 Agustus 2021. Pengumuman hasil review makalah 30 Agustus 2021. Batas akhir pengunggahan makalah yang telah diperbaiki 10 September 2021. Artikel yang memenuhi syarat akan dimuat dalam proseding internasional yang dipublikasikan oleh Atlantis Press di bawah penerbit Springer Nature. Terima kasih. To all presenters, kindly please upload the paper through the conference system following the timeline. The deadline for paper submission and publication payment is 19th August 2021. The results of paper review will be announced on the 30th of August 2021. And the deadline for revised paper submission in the, is on the 10th September 2021. And the eligible articles will be published in international proceedings by Atlantis Press under Spring the Nature Publisher. Thank you. Baik, hadirin semua, selamat beristirahat.
kita mulai sisi uh, setelah reaksi ya. Hadirin yang kami hormati, sesi paralel akan segera dimulai. Seluruh pembangunan paralel sesuai dengan pembagian ruang yang telah ditentukan oleh penitia. Apabila ada yang memiliki masalah sekaitan dengan teknis memasuki ruang paralel, silakan dapat menyampaikan masalah tersebut kepada panitia dengan menuliskan pesan di ruang obrolan. Terima kasih. Ladies and gentlemen, the parallel session will commence in a moment. All participants and presenters are requested to directly enter the chosen breakout room. And should you have problems to enter the breakout room, please do not hesitate to ask for assistance from the committee via chat room. Thank you. Untuk panitia ini kelihatannya sudah ada beberapa ya yang mengirim pesan. Belum. Iya ya, betul Bu Dela, ada beberapa yang masih kesulitan masuk. Karena breakout roomnya belum, join roomnya belum uh, muncul. Sudah di, di sudah bagian sudah. bawah ya kalau tidak salah. Oke. Okay. Ya, Bisa dicek ya. Bapak Ibu di bawah. Ya. Untuk yang oh menang. sudah, sudah, sudah. Sudah, 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 ada, ya. sudah, sudah ada. Yang menggunakan laptop silakan bisa dicek di bagian bawah. Silakan bergabung yang sudah.
good and human works in order to live in society. So culture can be seen from many system. For example, like environment, technology, economy, social organization, everything that involves human is a culture. And also what is the function of the culture itself? So the function of the culture itself is just um, to, um, let's say, as we know that culture has several characteristics, right? And then it has um, many things to define attitude, values, goals, myth, legend, and supernatural, and also behavior patterns. And talking about the other part of this uh, study, of course, um, since this is about communication and this is about talking to their friends, so um, interpersonal communication characteristic is also defined here. Like what kind of inter interpersonal communication? So this is like pretty much, uh, as we know that there are six characteristics of interpersonal communication, such as self interpersonal, transactional, and uh, several other parts about interpers interpersonal communication that requires physical closeness among people who communicate. And interpersonal communication also involves parties who depend on one another in the communication process. And interpersonal communication also cannot be changed or repeated. And now talking about impoliteness. So impoliteness is like, as we know, as, especially if you are Sundanese, there is a polite and impolite uh, words. So uh, the use of course language, of course, it's related to the impoliteness theory as well. So uh, according to Cole, uh, Cole paper, uh, there are several strategies of uh, impoliteness, for example, like bold on impo bold on recourse, uh, record impoliteness, which is like a perform indirect and then um, ambiguous, and also positive impoliteness. And then positive impoliteness is just like seeking disagreement, using a taboo or profane language, joking, using small talk or making people feel not uncomfortable. And also there is negative politeness and negative impoliteness. So negative impoliteness is just, uh, uh, in order, it, this is used to damage the address's negative face. For example, like understating the hearer, making someone frightened, insulting, harassing someone, taunting, doing something in sincerity. And also another impoliteness strategy is like off record impoliteness and it's just like an implica implicature such um, a way, to, uh, the one that un untributable intention. And also there is a withholding politeness. It's just like the absence of politeness work where it, <clears throat> it would be expected. For example, like failing as the student's first language. And these are some of the references I cite in this research. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. So thanks for your attention and time. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Ibu Hani Sarila, for your presentation. The next presentation is um, Ibu, still Ibu Nuria Haristiani, but with a different paper. So Ibu Nuria Haristiani, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the room keeper. Uh, I will uh, try to share screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, my presentation is uh, a little bit different. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I will use uh, a full screen because I need to see another um, explanation for my presentation. So uh, my title is Apology Speech Act in Japanese and Indonesian, focusing on responsibility and repair strategies. Uh, it is different from the one uh, I put in my abstract, I'm sorry, uh, because uh, the analysis is still going on and the data that could be presented. It is held through the uh, country to measure students' achievement and to improve the national education's quality. Uh, a previous study by Arifin and Zainal shows that the percentage of higher order thinking skill questions 
that are integrated into the national examinations questions are still limited. So the, the study confirmed that the questions on the national examin examinations are still dominated by questions requiring lots, while questions requiring hot still have a small proportion. Therefore, this study uh, aims to seek for another confirmation whether the national examination test item for senior high school level uh, in the years of two, 2000 and 17 up to 2019 have incorporated higher order thinking skills. And then we go to the literature review. Uh, the implications of HOTS based on Brookhart 2010. Okay. okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for coming to this presentation in this beautiful day. An honor to meet you here. Let me introduce myself. My name is Yuda, and I'm from Bandung. And I'm, I'm studying Japanese language education program in postgraduate UP. Okay, everyone. In this presentation, I will discuss about Directive Speech Act from supervisor to subordinate in Japanese companies. Hope you can stay with us until the end of the presentation. Well, let's get to the PowerPoint. Next, please. Okay. Searle stated in his book, communication is not just a simple word or sentence, but it will be more appropriate if it's called a product of result of a symbol, word, or sentence in the form of speech act behavior. Speech act behavior are effective of communicating to speech partner in everyday life, resulting an act or action of an utterance. Then what is a speech act? G.L. Austin said in his book, speech acts are speech acts that refer to the action performed by produce produce utterance, and then George Yule classified speech act into five groups. There are declarative, representative, representative expressive, directive, and commissive. Then, the reality in living in, living in globalized world requires that people interact with individuals who may have different language. This makes the communication become challenging in order to understand what the speaker intend. This is where the translator takes the important role. Directive speech is one of subfields pragmatic. It requires the translator to deliver the message as whole. It means the translator have complete control to choose vocabulary to translate it. But the letters young and real. And third. In the Zhang Eum and Yu may be in WhatsApp, 50 of participants realize consonant nasalization in the meeting form of letter Giyok with letter real. Then 41.18% of participants did not realize consonant nasalization in the meeting form of letter Giyok with letter real as well. So next slide. Now let's talk about the factor. First, regional origin. Participants who use Indonesian as the first language has the lowest realization rate, but it is because most of Indonesian native speakers have low topic level too. Second, topic level. It is considered that participants who have high topic level can realize nasalization well. Third, gender. Based on data, Men cannot pronounce nasalization well than women participants, but it has a relationship with topic level too, because most of men has lower topic level. Fourth, knowledge of nasalization theory. If the participants know about nasalization theory, they tend to realize nasalization. Fifth, knowledge of vocabulary. When participants know about the vocabulary, they tend to realize nasalization. 
but this has no correlation with frequency of use or sayong binto. This is because the frequency of use is extracted from Korean native corpus, so it has different application to Indonesian learners. The frequency of use does not impact on nasalization or participants' knowledge of those vocabulary. And then six, when consonant C and T meet consonant meme, participants tend to not nasalize C and T as nian. They pronounce it miem because miem comes after C and T. For example, when there is word not mal, they should be pronounced it as non mal, but they pronounce they pronounce it as namal. Okay, and then next slide. Okay. And the last, we conclude three things about this research. First, the most realized consonant nasalization type is soft chikume biumha or yume biumha type, with a percentage of 60.88% in the form letter yang meet letter real. Second, the most not realized consonant nasalization type is jange um and yu um may be. Let's see test cover uh, one uh, first language knowledge and uh, second language skills. Language knowledge included phonology, vocabulary, and or istima speaking hadasa, reading uh, kiraat and writing kitab. Next. Tes IBT. Uh, tes dengan sistem IBT merupakan tes yang paling populer dan banyak digunakan terutama sejak tahun 2005, yaitu sejak TUFEL memperlakukan IBT, IBT. Sistem tes yang uh, yang berbasis komputer ini berhubung dengan jaringan internet. Dengan demikian, tes dilakukan secara online. Sistem tes ini mulai dipublikasikan dan digunakan pada tahun 2005, tapi baru digunakan di Indonesia pada tahun 2006. Kemampuan yang disajikan meliputi reading, listening, writing. The goal here is we don't want to um, make some of the typology superior, but uh, not not also to make metasyntaxis number one priority because all of the typology have to be uh, implemented uh, in matter of balance. So there is some of balanced diet of typology and uh, to be succeed, Oxford uh, have claimed that we have to do a balanced diet of typology to be success in learning of uh, foreign language educate in foreign language education. And uh, in this research? From March to July this year, and we have 40 German students in second semester as the participants. And the qualitative descriptive approach uh, with uh, experimental and control class public opinion on One the content minute, of the speech. However, the gaslighting carried out didn't show any success because the community ended up continuing the existence of the Undang Undang Cipta Kerja and held further protests. And yeah, that's all of my presentations. Thank you for your attention and I apologize for my shortcomings. And please allowing me to answer your question in Bahasa. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Talita. Uh, the fifth presenter, Beta Rida Pasarebu, will not be presenting. So uh, this is the question and answer sessions of round one, which lasts for about 10 minutes. 
So please use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question to any of the presenter. You can turn on your microphone and speak directly when called upon. Please state your name and to whom you direct your questions. Is there any questions? Uh, Bestari Kirana Putri, you may uh, turn on your microphone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for the chance. I would like to ask a question to Ani Sulistio Rini. Um, the question is, based on, based on the data you obtain for the research, what areas can be developed related to teachers' belief? Is that clear enough? In related phenomena, because polite speech determines the use of the language, and the focus of this research are demonstrate types of euphemism in a lang in dialogue with bullying victim, and explain the implication of using euphemism principle of politeness in the dialogue with bullying victim. In this research, the researchers use a two theory. For the analysis a kind of euphemism, the researchers use the Alan Kate theory. Uh, in a book entitled Natural Language Semantic Purpose, 12, ty 12 types of euphemism. The first, remodeling. Second, phonetic similarity. Third, acronyms. for abbreviation. Fifth, verbal play. Six, Uh, suatu wacana uh, melajar juga atau responden juga diwawancarai agar tujuannya mereka uh, merangsang mereka untuk berbicara banyak karena dalam penelitian ini yang dibutuhkan itu bukan jawaban mereka salah atau benar atau bagaimana tapi mem, tapi dalam penelitian ini saya membutuhkan mereka banyak berbicara sehingga banyak juga data yang terkumpul dan di situ memang banyak kesalahan berupa penambahan bunyi kemudian analisis data di sini uh, secara umumnya menggunakan analisis data dari kualitatif deskriptif, yaitu reduksi data, penyajian data, dan menarik kesimpulan yang di dalamnya itu menggunakan analisis kesalahan juga oleh berdasarkan teori tarigan dan tarigan, juga menggunakan fonetik arti, analisis kesalahan fonetik artikulatoris yang dijelaskan oleh Hayat berupa membuat rekaman, transkripsi ejaan, mengurutkan bunyi atau realisasi fonem, menemukan jenis atau kategori kesalahan, kemudian di Uh, temukan beberapa kesalahan seperti yang akan saya jelaskan pada bagian selanjutnya. Silahkan. Uh, pada bagian pertemuan, hasil dan pembahasan. Nah, setelah melakukan uh, wawancara, kemudian melakukan transkrip di fonetis, di sini ditemukan 73 kesalahan. Nah, sebetulnya proses dari transkrip di fonetis ke simpulan seperti ini yang ada di tabel itu cukup uh, banyak juga, namun di sini saya me secara singkat menyebut uh, memperlihatkan di sini ada beberapa juga seperti sebenarnya yang seharusnya dikat, uh, diucapkan atau dilafalkan sebenarnya begitu, tapi di sini ada penambahan lain yaitu ada te, nah nanti dijelaskan juga dalam di dalam sisi fonetiknya. Nah, jika di menggunakan uh, transkripsi fonetik seperti ini atau realisasi fonem seperti ini nantinya akan muncul uh, minimal pairs atau pasangan minimal yang akan uh, memudahkan kita untuk menemukan fonem apa yang tiba-tiba muncul gitu yang seharusnya tidak ada. Ya, dari hasil analisis pada tabel tersebut diketahui bahwa bunyi bahasa yang paling banyak ditambahkan adalah bunyi e. boleh ke slide selanjutnya. Bunyi e sebanyak 35 kali. Nah, penambahan bunyi vokal e ini disebabkan karena orang Korea kesulitan melafalkan beberapa fonem di akhir kata atau yang berfungsi sebagai koda, sebab tidak ada di dalam bahasa Korea. Ya, jadi di dalam bahasa Korea ada beberapa fonem yang tidak ada sebagai koda. Nah, seperti uh, pembelajar itu kesulitan melafalkan bunyi se dan bunyi re di akhir kata. Uh, aturan pelafalan ini uh, mengacu pada aturan pelafalan di bahasa Korea, 
yaitu menurut Febrina dan kawan-kawan 2016 menjelaskan bahwa fonem S atau bunyi se hanya berdistribusi pada posisi awal dan tengah saja, jadi tidak ada bunyi se di akhir kata. Begitupun pada bunyi R atau e, fonem R atau bunyi R itu di Korea pada dasarnya tidak ada fonem R. Di Korea menggunakan huruf real atau huruf R-nya. Nah itu huruf R-nya itu untuk bahasa untuk e, penyebutan L dan juga R secara bersamaan begitu. Jadi ketika di awal kata atau di tengah kata itu ketika di tengah kata itu berfungsi sebagai R dan ketika di ketika di awal itu berfungsi sebagai L begitu. Jadi dalam da, satu lambang itu bisa e, mewakil mewakili beberapa bunyi. Begitu. Jadi ada beberapa kata memang seperti itu seperti bunyi se, bunyi re yang tidak ada di dalam bahasa Korea. Kurikulum 2013 in the first edition with the tag uh, 10 great books with 9 chapters, 11 great English textbooks with 5 chapters and the last one is 12 great English textbooks with 16 chapters. And so the data of this uh, study is the communication skills integrated within the textbook. Yang paling banyak adalah anak siksis jenis paragraf. Nah, jadi uh, di dalam teori ini menurut Mesli tahun 2015 menyebutkan bahwa are the findings of this study. Uh, there are 10 communication skills uh, based on Radipan and Duwanti's communication skills and they uh, compile uh, the indicators, communication skills indicators from uh, several studies and from the 10 until the 12th grade English textbooks, the overall uh, indicators, uh, it is highly about, oh, yeah. We still have about three minutes, everyone, to discuss this. If you have uh, other question, you can ask directly to the presenter. Uh, sorry, Miss. Actually, I have a question to the yes. presenter, but unfortunately, he's not in this room anymore. I can find his name. Is uh, it right? Yeah, I think he left already. Mm -mm. Yeah. What should we do? Maybe you can ask the question, then we can discuss the answer. Good, we can discuss together. Yeah, uh, my question is about the, can you show the PowerPoint again about Mr. Saidina? the conclusion of his paper. Yeah, uh, here, I want to state about the problem of voice when Aska speaks Indonesian, his mother tongue or first language. My question is, uh, is there any problem about the dyslexia uh, because he's, he said that uh, Aska only have a difficulties in showing or in speaking, especially, especially in Indonesia or 
or in his mother tongue. Apakah dia juga mengalami kesulitan dalam bahasa lainnya atau tidak? Itu sih inti pertanyaan saya, karena sedikit meragukan di bagian kopi di bagian penutupan ini. Karena kan hmm. kalau disleksia itu kan sebenarnya yang saya tahu itu kan adalah penyakit ya, memang fisik penyakit yang memang bawaan atau turunan yang bisa dimiliki oleh siapapun. Jadi wajar memang kalau misalnya saat uh, seseorang memiliki uh, masalah atau misalnya uh, pada bagian bukan cacat fisik tidak menyatakan cacat, tapi ada sesuatu hal yang janggal pada kondisi fisiknya, pasti otomatis akan mempengaruhi bagaimana cara dia berbicara mungkin. Nah itu ingin saya perjelas uh, lagi dengan presenter tadi. Kalau boleh izin <laughs> diskusi aja kali ya? Ya, mending kita diskusi aja. Jadi ya. tadi kita diam diam. Kalau kebetulan um, uh, saya pernah baca ini tuh karena orang disleksia itu memang uh, memiliki keterbatasan untuk uh, apa ya acquiring a language gitu. Jadi kayak uh, ketika dia baca tiba-tiba ada hurufnya yang goyang atau ada hurufnya yang hilang gitu. Jadi sebenarnya mau belajar bahasa apapun karena eh, memang di ada di, apa dari dari neuronnya itu memang ada misalnya aduh ada kalimat yang hilang atau misalnya hmm. ada misalnya perubahan jadi tiba-tiba dia nggak bisa ngomong gitu misalnya tiba-tiba harusnya z malah jadi apa gitu terus malah hmm. uh, masukin prefix sendiri gitu itu yang seperti aku tahu jadi sebenarnya no matter what language that they learn hmm. because it's about something in their Uh, neuron thing jadi kayak aduh nggak bisa baca kita gitu. kalau berarti, itu sih yang hmm, itu. berarti dalam penggunaan bahasa apapun sebenarnya ya saya juga mikirnya gitu karena yang saya tahu disleksia itu mereka tidak bisa menggunakan kayak kita biasa kayak gramernya gimana penyusunan kalimat yang benar itu seperti apa bahkan dia melihat kita melihat sih uh, ya point of view mereka dari huruf-huruf atau apalagi kalimat-kalimat itu beda dari banyak kita yang normal gitu saya hmm. Ya, saya memahami gitu, cuman itu yang saya pusingkan, maksudnya yang saya bingungkan Jadi, tadi pas presentasi. When they learn, ya sih, soalnya aku nggak ngerti juga kalau misalnya nggak ada orangnya. Jadi, uh, kayak berterbangan juga gitu. Jadi, kayak tulisan tuh bisa ter- berterbangan. Jadi, kayak yang hmm. meng- mengeja aja makannya susah gitu. Itu betul. Katanya seperti itu. Sayangnya, presenternya yang, har- yang mengerti seharusnya ya. Iya, ini kebetulan sih teman-teman aku pernah bikin tentang yang kayak gini jadi hmm. ngerti sedikit. Iya. Uh, uh, aku juga. juga. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. We are reached the time limit for the question and answer session. Yeah. Thank you for all your questions and responses. Now we are going to move on to the second round of the parallel session. Let me invite our first presenter of the second round in this parallel session. The first presenter is Miss Bahdiatul Mukaroma. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Hold on, let me share the PowerPoint first. Is this the PowerPoint, ma'am? Yeah, right. Okay, you can start as soon as you're ready. Okay, um, Victoria, hold one set. Never regret. If it's good, it's wonderful. If it's bad, it's experience. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings for all participants of Ecolite 2021 that we are proud of. Next. Okay, in a new in a new report from We Are Social, We Are Social Marketing Agency and Hitsit's social media titled Digital 2021: The Latest Insights into the State of Digital, it is said that out of a total of 274.9 million people in Indonesia, uh, 170 million of them use social media. 
And according to Statista, the majority of social media users in Indonesia in 2020 will be between the age of 18 and 34. Thus, social media-based linguistic practices have influenced young people's lingual practices in everyday life. Young people's linguistic creativity in practice has led to language divergence in Indonesia, according to Zain and Wagiati, 2018. Next. In that divergence, there are some words that are viral among the youngsters. However, the virality of a word or a phrase on social media is temporary and always changes from time to time. Meanwhile, the word or phrase that is now becoming viral can be categorized as amelioration, such as anjay, anjir, lingoy, and so on. Next. By seeing and analyzing this phenomenon, uh, we treat young researchers are ready to contribute to the society. This is me, Badiatul Mukaramah, and my colleagues, Fitriana Haryanti and Maratu Solihah, under the guidance of Mr. Fuji Karyanto SS Tanghum, proudly present the effect of the amelioration phenomenon on the virality of a phrase in Indonesia. Next. Uh, there are two aims in this research. First, projecting the phenomenon of shifting meaning or amelioration that, tra that treasures virality in society. And second, describing the phenomenon of using viral words that change through amelioration. Next. Uh, in this research, we use qualitative method and uh, the data that we used uh, are primary data from interview from the linguist in Balai Bahasa Jawa Timur and the secondary data uh, we, gain, we get it from literature and literature review and internet. Next. Here is the literature review that uh, used. The first, amelioration is the process of modifying meaning so that new meaning is better than the old one. Better in this case is like when we say that word, uh, we have less pressure to say it than the original word. For example, like when we say uh, anji, it is we, like we have more pressure to say it rather than anjay, that kind of thing. And also the second one, slang is one of the many language variations that exist in today's culture, especially among young people. The situation in which slang is employed, particularly as a linguistic variety, Utilized in close, intimate, and relaxed and relaxed social situations has a significant impact on its use. And according to the KBBI, trend is the latest sign. In everyday life, the term trending is frequently used to describe a scenario in which something is popular or a source of concern by the majority of people. Next. Uh, so this, this is the result and findings that we found when we are doing this research. So the finding from this research found that the phenomenon of amelioration in society is temporary as slang in general. Amelioration as a refinement of meaning is also able to become a viral because of an adjustment of sound or we usually call it as euphonic, which is easily expressed by the public or the speakers. Well, our research of amelioration phenomenon resulted in the following findings and results. And we found that phrase uh, indicated uh, experiencing amelioration such as you can see in here, anja, which is the finding of a dog, and then meningoy, uh, and then ngadi ngadi, and so on. And there are still other small phrases that file among the public, as we usually found it in social media. So, uh, the phrases, according to the research, are from of amelioration, which later developed in society. And why the phrase of amelioration can become a vital thing among the public? So, according to the linguist at the Language Center of East Jakarta Province, the priority of a phrase can be caused by phrases that are easy to hear and easy to pronounce and are suitable in describing an expression. Meanwhile, the phrase amelioration contains similar euphonic, which tends to trigger viral in the community. Next. Yeah, so, sorry, can you back in the previous? I forget some part there. Uh, 
and uh, as we know, the faculty of a thing must have a time limit, as well as the phenomenon of the faculty of a phrase. So final phrases, including those that have amelioration, tend to be temporary as life in general, lasting only a few months or years, after which they will be replaced by other phrases. So that they're only uh, for some time. Next. For the conclusions, uh, finally, based on the research that we have conducted, the conclusion that can be formed in is that the phenomenon of amelioration in the society is temporary as a sign in general. Amelioration as a refinement of meaning is also able to become a viral because of the adjustment of sound or we call it euphonic, which is easily expressed by the public speakers. Yes. So this is the references that we used to uh, to do this research and make this EDP. So that's all our presentation. If you have any question, uh, you can get in after this presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you for your presentation. Now, everyone, let's give a big round of applause for Ms. Bahdiatul Mukaroma. That was a very interesting talk indeed. And now let's move on to our next presenter, Miss Amanda Sejati. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Miss Amanda, uh, I am really sorry, but I couldn't find the PowerPoint in the website. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can share the presentation, ma'am. Okay, I'll share my uh, slide. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, first, first thing to do, I would like to say thanks for the committee that uh, given us opportunity for sharing our research result. Uh, I am the representative of my teams. Consists of me, Amanda, and Sifarini Andayani, Deda Ningrum, Emir Indayani, Ahmad Purnama. Uh, in today's conference, I would like to share the research result entitled Speech Act Representation of Doctors Patient Interaction in Gray's Anatomy TV Serial. For the introduction, uh, as we know that today, now, we are in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we can we, we can we can see that this pandemic can affect many aspects in our daily life. Uh, and I would like to uh, give an example in the education context. Uh, the example of the effect uh, the effect of COVID nineteen pandemic on education is the transition from face to face learning to distance learning or online learning. Based on the research conducted by Inside Higher Education and Hanover Research Survey of Higher Education Administrator in 2020, uh, one of the problem that may face by university is limited access to training facilities. And this problem uh, could be the serious problem for medical students, uh, especially nursing students. And I want to focus on nursing students. Because the nursing students cannot reach the 
training facilities or they have restricted access so it it, it may it may uh, make nursing students cannot build their pragmatic competence because pragmatic competence can be can be built uh, by understanding speech act and this speech act uh, can be exposed when students doing uh, practical a clinical practical uh, session and clinical clinical session can be done in hospital and clinic um, okay based on this thought uh, we want to offer the media that can enhance students' pragmatic competence. That is, uh, that is understanding speech act in Gray's Anatomy uh, TV serial. Why you choose Gray's Anatomy a TV serial? Because this movie contains a natural context and linguistic features uh, that used by medical uh, practitioner. And for literature review, we use two theories. Uh, the first theory is speech act theories initiated by Austin that divide uh, utterances into uh, locution, elocution, and elocution. And we use second theories that is elocutionary theories uh, developed by Searle that categorize uh, elocutionary act into five uh, types assertive, directive, commissive, expressive, and declarative. Uh, we use these uh, tools for analyzing our data. And we come to the method. This is, this is qualitative research uh, by using pragmatic approach. And in this case, we use elocutionary speech act theory by Searle. And we use the data. Uh, get taken from Grace Anatomy TV serial season 16. In this season, in this season, in this season, it contains 25 uh, episodes and we choose six episodes by using purposive sampling technique because this episode uh, contain more doctors, patients seen than the other episode in this season. And for the data, we use doctor's utterances when the doctors uh, when the doctor talk to the patient. And here are the results. Um, we found four speech act in doctor's speech act. Uh, Representative, speech act, expressive, directive, and commissive. And from the uh, from the data, we can see that two kind of speech act are dominated in this uh, case. The first is representative. Uh, the, the representative speech act has eighty four percent. It can show the existence, the existence of communication that aims to build the patient's understanding of medical treatment when, uh, when they need to be treated. And the second, second speech act that is dominated, a directive speech act. It has um, thirty three point. 55%, it can show the doctor's effort to direct patients to improve the quality of health. And the next speech act is commissive. And it, it, uh, it can show that there is a doctor's effort to promise health service and there is a problem 
uh, probability of healing. And the last speech act, uh, expressive speech act, this, this, this speech act can be due to the existence of doctors, professional code of ethics that require that requires being able to make professional decision independently. So the doctors uh, tend to avoid emotional conversation. Uh, and we will show the examples of each speech, speech act. The first, the example of representative speech act. Um, the act that appear on the data for representative speech act are state, show, explain, assert, deny, describe, and agree. And the example of utterances, utterance, it is, it's not your heart, it's the anti-rejection meds you take from your heart, they had a toxic effect on your kidneys. Um, for this utterance, uh, we we classify to to representative speech act because the patient uh, give a response that 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 CC CC is the patient CC is understand about the doctor's explanation so that they so so the patient uh, say. I need a kidney transplant. And the second example is about directive utterance. This utterance is said by Dr. Jackson Avery. It might sting a little bit. Uh, we classify this as directive because the doctor want the patient to prepare the effect of the treatment will be given. And the next example is commission. What, ma'am? You have two minutes left. Okay. Uh, commission. Uh, here, here is the utterance. Why we classify this as commission? Because the doctor will will check the patient in the future. And the expressive. Uh, so sorry, she didn't make it. Uh, we classify this as condolence because the doctors uh, say this utterance when when the doctors tell about the accident victim caused by CC. For the conclusion, in this study, the data collected was dominated by representative and directive speech act. This is in line with the type of the film that is the source of research data. This film tells about an activity in hospital, including communication cures between the patient and the doctor. In this communication, the explanation and direction produced by the doctors are expressed into the speech partner, in this case, is patient, so that it is accordance with the understanding of representative and directive speech act. And it is the part of our research and in the future, we will make the corpus based on the uh, doctor's utterances in medical context. That's all from us. Thanks for all listening. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for your presentation. Everyone, please give a big round of applause for Miss. Amanda Sejati. Um, now we are continue to the third presenter of this second round. The third presenter is Miss Weni Desari. Is Miss Weni Desari in the room? I don't think the presenter is here. Okay. Well, then we can.
continue to the next presenter. The fourth presenter is Miss Mila Ida Nurhidayah. Miss Mila, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm in. Okay, then. Miss Mila, do you want uh, me to share the screen or you? Yes, because the connection is bad here. Oh, okay. Hold on. Is this the PowerPoint, Miss? Yes, this is. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Mira Idanur Hidayah. I'm from UN Sunan Gunung Jati, Bandung. Here I would like to present my paper with the title A Portrait of Indonesian EFL Teacher Talk and Student Talk in English Classroom in Thailand, an International Teaching Practical Context. Next slide, please. Okay. The aim of this research is to look into the interaction of teacher talk and student talk in an EFL classroom in Thailand. When it comes to such an EFL classroom, classroom interaction is a significant aspect of the teaching and learning process since it allows for knowledge exchange and strengthening of the given information. As a result, it is the interaction that determines the success of both the teacher and the student. However, according to some and one 2020, that classrooms are frequently demonstrated to be teacher-dominated, which may have unexpected effects on the student learning process, and it requires further investigation through this research. Next slide, please. Okay, the theory of the this, the theory of this research uh, is using Quenders theory, 1970. This is the latest theory that can be used to investigate the research. According to Penders, 1970, classroom interaction has three types, which are teacher talk, student talk, and silence. Teacher talk uh, is divided into two subcategories, which are direct influence and indirect influence. Indirect influence uh, consists of accepting praise or encouragement, accept or use students' ideas, asking question and asking question. Meanwhile, the direct influence consists of lecturing, giving direction, criticizing, or justifying authority. In addition, indirect influence is when the teacher gives opportunity to students to participate. Meanwhile, direct influence means the teacher's initiation to speak. What's more, there are two categories of student talk, which are student talk response. It is the student's response to the teacher. And student talk initiation, it is the student initiate, initiate talking to whoever. Next slide, please. The methodology of the research, uh, the research uh, utilizes a qualitative method in the form of a descriptive design. And the research site is taken place at Muslim Success School in Satun, Thailand. In addition, uh, the research participants are one Indonesian English teacher and 31 Thailand students in the second grade. Uh, in addition, the research instruments used were table matrix of Prendex Interaction Analysis Categories or PIAC and Interview. Next slide, please. And this is the finding uh, of the research. From the seven types of teacher talk, there are six types teacher talk that arise in EFL classroom in Thailand. Accepting feeling, accepting feeling type is not present in the EFL classroom. Price or encouragement has percentage 5.6%. Accepting or using ideas of the student has percentage 8.3%. Asking question 24.9%. Lecturing 5.6%. Giving direction 11%. 0.74% and criticizing or justifying authority has the percentage of 0.61%. So the total amount of indirect talk is 38.626%. Meanwhile, direct talk has the total amount of 17.41%. Next slide, please. 
and this is the finding of the student talk that arise in an EFL classroom in Thailand. Both of the student talk response and the student talk initiation uh, is found in EFL classroom. It, student talk response has a percentage 38.46%, whereas uh, student talk initiation has percentage 2.23%. So the total amount of the student talk is 40.69%. Therefore, the impacts of teacher talk to students in an EFL classroom in Thailand, since the students initiated talk accounts for only 2.23% of our students' interaction, this creates unspoken barriers for students to recognize the proper time to talk and how to formulate the talk, with feeling at ease to share ideas, ex expressing feelings, and discussing problems. According to the research findings, the student's talk ratio is strongly imbalanced toward this response rather than initiation. Furthermore, uh, the impact of this might result in students become less forthcoming in contributing. In addition, the students also lack confidence to initiate talk because of the imbalance of indirect teacher talk. Next slide, please. Sum up, there are six types of teacher talk were found to have been used within the classroom, which are uh, asking questions, giving direction, accepting or using students' idea, lecturing, price or encouragement, and criticizing or justifying authority. However, the category of accepting feeling was not present. In addition, in the term of student type, student, student, student talk types, both the student talk response and the student talk initiation are found. The student reveal the impact on learning of the teacher talk and the student talk in this context was that the student lack confidence to initiate talk due to the imbalance of indirect teacher talk. The student may also be used as a reference for teachers to reflect and improve on their use of talk and activities for students in the classroom. The last, the last slide is the reference that used in the research, and that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now let's give a big round of applause for Miss Mila Ida Nur Hidayah. It was very insightful talk indeed. All right, everyone, the last presenter is Miss Astari Mirisia. Yeah, I'm here. Oh. Miss Astari, would you uh, share your screen or let me share the screen? Uh, I'll share my share screen. Oh, okay. Just wait a minute. Okay, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes, it's crystal clear. Okay, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the moderator who has invited me to start the presentations today. Hi everyone, I am Astari Mirisha and educational psychology students from the postgraduate school of the Indonesian University, Indonesian Education of the University. Uh, on this occasion, I join as a presenter, but unfortunately, both of my colleagues can not join this presenter today. Uh, the title of the article that I will present today is about learning readiness of postgraduate students in higher education about literature review. Okay, there are many things that need to be seen and evaluated from today's higher education, starting from how the objective, the curriculum used, to what is reflective to the education taken. Now, higher education is no longer seen as just a way to teach available social, social knowledge in the community, but also a process where value is determined by how many direct benefits can be provided and received by students and the society itself. 
Especially now, the higher education system has taken a different system from the past, which is evident by the current higher education system that is increasingly complicated. Example, the mastery of the material understanding of the English as an international language, sociocultural understandings, and etc. And then require students to be more competent in each file of their major. But not only that, the education system in developing countries in the world has also innovated following a new era known as industrial, industrial revolutions era, which integrates cyber or digital technology, technology into the world of learning. Of course, in order to achieve this educational goal, many factors also influence it, starting from how university added the appropriate curriculum and prepare human resource for student itself in higher education to be ready to learn. From the description of the problem, it can be seen that there are many things that must be considered in higher education, especially for the student themselves. They are really required to prepare themselves physically and mentally to learn. This is not only for undergraduate students, but also for students postgraduate program or doctoral program. Readiness to learn and the participation of students in learning activities are the most consistent factor to predict learning success in higher education. Thorndike also said that readiness it is pre-requisite for the next study. Okay, from the many articles found relate to the readiness to study for postgraduate students in higher education, the other, uh, I with my friends, found that at least more than 50% of the research subject studied did not have a good or higher level of readiness, of readiness while studying in college. As explained by Tahiru and Kamaluddin, in the result of their research on the readiness for independent study, study in some postgraduate students, the most postgraduate students are not sure of their learning readiness when they will undergo a learning program run by the campus. From here, we can see that postgraduate students who should have been able to apply learning independent, independently are still not aware of existing technological advance, especially at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which demand spontaneous change to the world educational system. Method in this paper, the research method used is literature review. This literature review relates to the topic of student readiness to learn, especially adult students who continue the student in postgraduate or doctoral programs. Here, the others see that the research relates to the readiness to study in higher education of postgraduate students has not been reviewed so much. In the study, we conduct a systematic literature review of this research by analyzing various graduate student readiness paper from several articles, search site, and accredited journals such as Google Scholar, Google Scholar Stage, Classifier, Sign Direct, and etc. Therefore, the researchers intend to review existing articles on learning readiness so that in the future, it can be used as an appropriate reference to support future research. Finding and discussions. After reviewing and analyzing the readings, the other found several findings, including some graduate students still have, sorry, some postgraduate students still have a low level of readiness in the specific skill required by the campus. This is explained by the fact that there are still many postgraduate students who cannot show good results in certain special abilities that are expected by the campus. Regardless of the extent to which students are prepared to study in higher education, the other also see that most research related to student, student, student readiness for higher education is related to the contributions made by the campus. Various programs formed by the campus require students to be ready, able, and able to complete this program. In addition, we found that most of the research in the topic of learning readiness is still rare that examines the interpersonal aspect of the students. Most studies only look at the correlations between learning readiness uh, at the students' learning outcomes. 
researcher see that there are still rarely study study of learning readiness related to how students are prepared in terms of physical, mental, emotional, social, social or the term of the fund. The conclusion, it can be concluded that the level of learning readiness of students in postgraduate or doctoral school in higher education is still low. We can see this from we can see this from various reference which said that postgraduate students still do not have a good readiness to participate in the activities provided by the study program of faculty. In addition, the aspect of learning readiness is still an issue that is well, rarely considered by students themselves, as evidenced by higher education institutions that form various special programs to improve aspects of student readiness in their lifelong learning. In addition, Topics related to the aspect of learning readiness for postgraduate students still revolve around special programs run by the campus. Here, the researcher, the researcher sees that a research that examines the perspective of learning readiness from the interpersonal aspect of graduate students themselves, such as uh, their thinking skill, their self-esteem, socio-emotional, is still lacking and few. Furthermore, the researchers hope that from this paper, ideas or, or research gap will emerge that other researchers can use in studying various cases related to studying readiness to learn or adult learner adult learner adult learners in higher education okay that's all of my presentations i'm sorry for deliver this uh, the i deliver the presentations thank you Back to the moderator. Hi, Mericia. It was a very informative talk indeed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the question and answer session for round two. The same as previous round, please mention your name and state to which presenter you address your question. If you would like to ask, you can turn on your microphone starting from now. Please, everyone, if you have any question. Um, I actually have a question for the last presenter. It's about the uh, readiness. Yes. Learning yes. readiness. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, do you want me to use English or Indonesian? I'm sorry? Do you want me to use English or Indonesian? Uh, Indonesian, please. Okay. Okay. So... Um, Uh, let's how to start this. Oke, okay. um, kita tahu gitu kan sekarang uh, banyak anak-anak SD yang setidaknya mereka tuh harus bisa baca dan menulis sebelum dia masuk SD gitu pada umur 7 tahun. Pengalaman saya waktu zaman waktu saya dulu itu, saya waktu umur 4 tahun saya udah masuk SD gitu. Dan itu udah bisa nulis, udah bisa baca gitu. Nah, sekarang mirisnya itu karena online begini ya, pandemi kayak gini, Uh, kan jadi anak-anak TK juga nggak 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 puguh gitu ya istilahnya ya nggak puguh. Terus pas mereka masuk SD dan ketika dapat uh, pembelajaran yang lumayan ah lebih lebih aneh gitu ini pelajaran susah banget buat anak kelas 1 gitu. Uh, udah nggak bisa nulis nggak bisa nggak bisa baca soalnya waktu TK-nya nggak 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 apa ya nggak nggak kondusif gitu waktu TK-nya jadi Walaupun dia umur 7 tahun dan dia udah masuk kelas 1 sekarang tahun ini dia nggak bisa ngapa-ngapain gitu. Terus aku ngelihat soalnya itu pengalaman ponakan ya, aku ngelihat soalnya ini soal anak kelas 1 kok begini amat gitu ya. Nah, pasalnya waktu dulu nggak gini-gini amat, ini kayak pertanyaannya tuh aneh terus ada pertanyaan yang ambigu kayak misalnya 
bahagia itu apa nah itu kan itu maksudnya apa gitu bahagia itu nah kalau misalnya dari sisi mbaknya gitu ya seperti misalnya kasus-kasus seperti ini tuh termasuk itu gimana sih menanggapinya karena si anak ini pasti nggak akan siap lah dengan semua pertanyaan seperti itu dengan ya and considering all the reasons because of the pandemic like ya yeah. coba bagaimana Oke, okay, terima kasih Mbak. Memang betul ya, ini udah jadi PR bagi kita pendidik ya, terutama ya. Karena memang sebelum pandemi pun, ini sebenarnya udah jadi satu hal yang problematika gitu di sistem pendidikan di Indonesia. Karena sebelum pandemi pun memang sudah banyak anak-anak yang banyak kasus memang dari SD, apalagi SMP, apalagi SMA, yang saat usianya seharusnya ya, kalau di perkembangan, psikologi perkembangan uh, anak itu, itu mereka sudah mencapai tahap yang sudah bisa mengolah kata, bisa, sudah bisa uh, mengolah kalimat, menyusun kata menjadi kalimat, itu simpelnya. Tapi sayangnya di umur yang 8 tahun, bahkan umur 7 tahun, mereka masih kesusahan. Nah, sebenarnya ini multifaktor ya, kenapa banyak bisa terjadi hal seperti ini. Kalau misalnya kita kaitkan dengan uh, economical, ekonomi ya, ekonomi di Indonesia itu karena banyak orang tua yang memang, kan pendidikan pertama itu kita dari keluarga ya, Jadi memang uh, keikutsertaan orang tua dalam memberikan uh, pendidikan pada anak itu sangat penting sekali. Nah sayangnya karena kondisi di Indonesia juga beragam ya, tidak semuanya bercukupan, tidak semuanya mampu memberikan uh, waktu bagi anak-anak mereka untuk belajar, untuk mendampingi pembelajaran mereka, sayangnya itu jadi salah satu kendala. Memang banyak faktor yang mempengaruhi itu adalah karena kesiapan fisik. Selain fisik si anak itu. Jadi, Karena fisik dia dia tidak siap, dia tidak terbiasa dengan cara belajar, cara mendengarkan yang baik, cara berbicara dengan baik, dan sayangnya tidak di partisipasi, tidak ada partisipasi dari orang tua juga. Nah itu akan mempengaruhi lagi. Kebanyakan kasus-kasus mungkin bisa nanti dilihat juga dari beberapa referensi lain. Kebanyakan memang datang dari si murid. Nah lain halnya lagi dengan uh, pendidikannya sendiri, baik di sekolah, baik di formal ataupun non formal ya. Karena kan. Sekarang sudah banyak juga sekolah-sekolah atau tempat bermain bagi anak-anak yang sebelum memasuki SD ya. Nah, kebanyakan memang kita kan sekarang udah kurikulum baru ya. Kalau dulu mah kita masih kurikulum. Zaman-zaman itu kan dulu berbeda-beda. Dan memang sih zaman-zaman dulu itu kalau saya perhatikan lagi setelah mendengarkan statement dari Mbak tadi, iya ya, zaman-zaman dulu juga umur 4 tahun, 5 tahun udah bisa masuk SD. Dan mereka tuh udah bisa... nangkap apa maksud gurunya gitu. Sayangnya sekarang yang dulu kata-katanya anak-anak zaman milenial tuh justru lebih pintar, lebih jenius ya. Tapi sayangnya mereka terbatas dari kemauan mereka, kesiapan mereka. Nah, kenapa? Nah, itu yang ingin saya lihat di sini. Apa sih faktornya gitu? Karena kebanyakan pun yang menggali tentang readiness, khususnya ini saya di postgraduate ya, adult learners sebenarnya. Kadang orang melihat yang harus siap belajar itu cuma anak-anak TK, cuma anak-anak SD. Yang memang memang penting sekali untuk mempersiapkan mereka untuk belajar karena belajar itu nggak mudah ya, cuma buka buku, nulis, dengar guru enggak kan. Jadi banyak hal yang memang harus terandil. Seperti juga tadi yang dari keynote speaker Miss Herman eh, Miss eh Mr. Seperti tadi. Nah, dia juga bilang kan bahwa memang bagaimana cara guru menyampaikan pembelajaran itu juga penting sekali bagi si muridnya. Jadi, kalau komunikasinya berjalan dengan baik, maka pasti akan ada input bagi si student, bagi si muridnya. Jadi, banyak faktor memang, Mbak. Ini memang jadi, kalau dalam pendidikan ya, kasus-kasus seperti ini itu sudah banyak sekali, ber, beribu-ribu mungkin. Dan banyak, sayangnya, penyelesaiannya sampai sekarang hanya terlihat pada contohnya pengubahan kurikulum. kalau dari pemerintah ya, pengembangan kurikulum atau dari sekolah-sekolah itu misalnya bikin uh, apa gitu, kelas tambahan misalnya, atau ada guru pendamping lagi bagi sekolah-sekolah tertentu gitu ya, swasta dan negeri pun. Jadi beragam sih, cuman yang jadi yang jadi kebingungan saya juga kenapa membahas ini adalah kenapa sih kita harus berpatokan kepada apa penyelesaiannya dulu, kenapa nggak kita cari tahu dulu masalahnya. Karena kebanyakan juga saya lihat, karena saya kan dari psikologi uh, pendidikan ya, saya mengkaji juga psikologi si pesertanya, kenapa kita tidak melihat dari si anaknya dulu misalnya, atau si gurunya dulu misalnya. Apa sih yang kurang, apa sih masalahnya, kenapa sampai uh, pembelajaran itu tidak efektif. Seperti itu. 
Nah itu yang ingin saya sampaikan. Uh, saya ini kan kayaknya cuma saya deh yang di sini yang cuma literatur itu ya, karena memang ini jadi bagian dari tesis saya juga, insya Allah. Uh, dan saya ingin mengajak juga sih, ternyata masih banyak loh masalah-masalah yang kecil sebenarnya, tapi punya impact besar sebenarnya kalau dalam mempersiapkan uh, pembelajaran yang efektif itu seperti apa. Terutama yang saya ingin kaji itu adalah dari diri kita sendiri ya, dari si pesertanya, dari student. Terutama untuk tesis saya itu adalah kita-kita yang uh, adult learners, yang ikut S2, S2. yang lanjut S2. Mm-hmm. Seperti itu, Mbak. Yeah. Oke, okay. that's a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Mungkin ada yang lain? Silakan. Silakan yang lain kalau masih ingin bertanya. Masih ada waktu sekitar 2 menit. Everyone, while waiting for the question, allow me to remind you again to fill in the exit ticket as a prerequisite for your certificate. The link is on the chat box in the main room. Any other question? I don't think so. I think all done. We still have one and a half minutes. Ini di sini jam tiga malam soalnya. <laughs> jam tiga malam. Iya. Yeah. Ini saya lihat ada dari pri tiga, pri dua, pri room dua juga. Ini maksudnya salah, salah rungkah atau gimana menonton, ya, Mbak? Menonton aja. Oh, oke. Okay. Beres kayaknya mereka. Assalamualaikum. Alright, if there is no more question, then. Now we reach the time limit for the question and answer session. Thank you all for all your question and responses. I am really appreciated. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our presentation. We would like to say thank you again for all of your the presenters and uh, for your
Welcome to the Faculty of Language and Literature Education of Green Green Campus Environment and Convenient Workplace. Our outdoor lounge space includes a green area that students and campus community may walk around to have fresh air. Some additional facilities in this pandemic include things that students, teaching staff, employees, and guests should wash their hands before getting into the front door to have their temperature checked. Everyone is welcome to come into the building by following the coronavirus protocols provided by the faculty. The building is also accessible for the disabled as it has ramps for wheelchair users, people pushing strollers, carts, or other wheeled objects. The Faculty of Language and Literature Education, most commonly referred to as FPBS, is home for students, faculty members, staff, and alumni. The faculty offers language studies and language education based discipline including study programs of Indonesian language and literature and Indonesian language education, Sundanese language education, English and literature and English language education, Arabic language education, Japanese language education, German language education, French language education, and Korean language education. Both academic and non-academic activities are supported by top-notch facilities for faculty members to help students learn and for students to develop themselves, including classrooms. Our classrooms are designed to accommodate around 25 to 30 students equipped with ready-use projector for lecturer to play the slides of presentation, videos, and other teaching materials. Whiteboard is provided to accommodate more conventional teaching and learning activities. To be more inclusive, left-handed student tests are also available in classrooms. To meet the demand of learning in the 21st century, the faculty has made smart classrooms available to enable students to experience learning in the current situation with rich learning materials powered by the internet. This also enables lecturers to deliver learning contents more effectively by using different projections in their presentation to explain a topic. Available smart classrooms allow learning with multimedia such as using tablets according to the user comfort camera to allow live broadcast providing a more real experiment learning. More real learning is made available by smart classroom. Additionally, smart classroom support electricity savings. The Faculty of Language and Literature Education is supported with modern language laboratories where students learn language skills such as listening, speaking, interpreting, and other learning activities involving multimedia support. For student teachers, the faculty offers a close to actual teaching situation, micro teaching to have students learn to teach, allow lecturers to view teaching practices and provide feedback for the improvement of their teaching skills. This micro teaching is supported by a model classroom between two monitoring rooms, allowing lecturers to see the student teachers teaching from many angles. The faculty has been granted funds to build a library in the third floor and build a library in the first floor. The library in the first floor is commonly referred to Self Access Center or SEC where students can read available books, journal, articles on the screen or paper and work on the assignment. We have a lounge which is called Academic Lounge accessible to our current graduate and postgraduate students. This room is designed for a multi-purpose space. The space includes the 12-person conference room area for advising activities, students' roundtable discussion, and other group academic talks. Here are samples so, of teaching and learning videos. Uh, Karima, Rafi, and oh. uh, Ajum. Okay, cool. Presenting uh, the first five chapters, which uh, is about 
get you the stage. We uh, are <clears throat> at the Tokyo Education doing economy. We can see the All features here. By supporting the university's mission to be a leading and outstanding university, we hope to maintain and develop excellent language and literature studies and education in Indonesia.
Pak Rudi. Halo. Baik. Berilah monitor. Halo, halo. Ya. Oke. Okay. Baik, hadirin yang kami hormati, kami mengundang semua partisipan untuk kembali bergabung di ruang utama. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, the... we invite you all to enter the main room, please. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you to enter the main room, please. Baik hadirin kita tunggu sebentar masih ada ruang beberapa ruang yang masih menyelesaikan sesi paralel kita tunggu sampai pukul 3 tepat Baik, hadirin yang kami hormati, sesi paralel telah selesai. Sebelum acara penutupan seminar, kami akan mengumumkan tiga pemakalah terbaik dan tiga peserta terbaik. Before the conference closing ceremony, we would like to announce the award winners for two categories, best presenters and best participants. Baik, mohon bantuan kepada host untuk menayangkan hasil tiga pemakalah terbaik dan tiga peserta terbaik. Mohon host bisa menayangkan, Bu Suci. Monitor, Bu Suci. Mohon dapat ditampilkan tiga pemakalah terbaik.
Baik, baik. Terima kasih ada panitia yang sudah menyampaikan uh, hasil seleksi untuk tiga pemakalah terbaik dan tiga peserta terbaik. Kami ucapkan selamat kepada yang terpilih dan mohon dapat menghubungi panitia melalui kontak yang tadi sudah disampaikan. Panitia. Di mana dulu the best presenters dan partisipansnya bisa dipanggil Apa? biar kita bisa ambil foto session. Baik. Ya, terima kasih. Baik kepada uh, pemakalah tiga pemakalah terbaik yang tadi sudah disampaikan dan tiga peserta terbaik, mohon panitia bantuan panitia untuk bisa diberi pin untuk bisa ditayangkan. Mohon untuk bisa mengaktifkan kamera. Sudah. Sudah, baik. Ada tiga pre tiga pemakalah terbaik. Mungkin bisa dipin lagi. Ya, on three best presenters and three best participants. Please turn on the camera. And the best presenter itu Rahmawati dan itu bagus Zamzam Har Arif dari Universitas Jambi, Pi Widayani di Universitas Negeri Jakarta, Sara Aisyah. Kesepakatan Rita Johan Gunadarma University, Jadi Herli Gayan Langsa, Astar Ngirija Universitas Pendidikan. Mungkin dari panitia mau mengambil gambar? Apakah sudah semua Pak Rudi? Sepertinya Apakah belum. Sudah hadir Sepertinya. dan ditampilkan belum ya? Sepertinya masih ada harusnya enam ya. Ini baru berapa? Ibu Rahmawati, wajahnya bisa diperlihatkan Ibu. Ibu Rahmawati. Ibu Rahmawati mohon bisa di... Nah, uh, mungkin penutup penutup lensanya barangkali ya dibuka baik baru empat ya untuk the best participants nah, mau dipisah ibu dulu best Ayah. participant nah, mulai ya berfotonya ya bagaimana ibu Astari ya uh... Saya kebetulan yang terpilih juga ya. Tapi mohon maaf saya tidak bisa menampilkan background-nya. Oh, oke. Okay. Ini untuk yang best presenter dulu, mungkin? Panitia sudah mengambil gambar? Ya, mohon ditunggu sebentar Pak Rudi. Baik, baik siap. Ya, mohon bersiap. Ibu Rahmawati bisa diatur kembali posisi kameranya supaya wajah ibu lebih terlihat full di kamera. Ya, cukup Ibu Rahmawati. Terima kasih. Mohon bersiap. Mohon tidak ada dulu yang mengirimkan pesan di room chat ya agar tidak mengganggu tampilan layarnya. Baik. Satu, dua, tiga. Ada gaya bebas, silahkan. <laughs> Ya, bebasnya. Pak Tubagus silahkan ekspresikan Mbak. Kan Bapak Tri sebagai pemenang silahkan Satu, dua, tiga Ibu Bapak di reaction itu bisa di, dipilih stiker Mohon berkenan memilih stiker Bisa mem, memberikan stiker eh, hati Atau stiker tepuk tangan mungkin Supaya terlihat ini Nah, terima kasih Bu Rahmawati Diikuti yang lain Udah. Siap, apa Bumi? Ya, satu, dua, tiga. Ya, terima kasih banyak. Sekarang kita akan beralih ke pemenang hadiah berikutnya. 
Ya, silakan untuk peserta terbaik bisa diberi pin juga untuk bisa fokus ditampilkan di layar. I'd like to invite the best participants, Ibu Rita Johan, Bapak Dedi Suherli, Ibu Astari Mirisha. Uh, Bu, mohon maaf, Bukan? nama saya Dedi Suheri, Bu. Oh, ini tul ditulisnya Dedi Suherli. Mohon maaf, Bapak, Dedi Suheri. Ya, mohon maaf. Suheri, ya. Dedi Suherli. Atau betul ada apa, nama yang lain, kan? Pak Dedi Suherli, Suheri, atau hanya Mandu Suheri? Oh, ya, baik. Dedi Suheri. Oh, Dedi Suherli dari IAIN Langsa? Iya. Betul. Oh, iya. Satu lagi, Bu Astari, ya? Belum di Iya, Ibu Astari Mirisha. Ya, mohon bersiap Ibu Rita, Bapak Dedi dan Ibu Astari. Saya akan mulai mengambil gambarnya dengan gaya biasa dulu. Mohon sekali lagi tidak ada yang mengirimkan pesan di room chat. Mohon bersiap 1 2 3. Sekarang untuk gaya bebasnya, silahkan keluarkan ekspresi bahagianya. 1 2 3. Pose terakhir, oh, tolong berikan reaction-nya. Di kolom reaction, silahkan berikan hati atau tepuk tangan. Ya, silahkan. Siap. Kak Dedi, ya. Siap, satu, dua, tiga. Terima kasih banyak. Selamat sekali lagi kepada para pemenang, Pak Rudi, Bu Dela. Silahkan memimpin kembali acara. Baik, terima kasih. Terima kasih. yang sudah memimpin, uh, mengarahkan untuk pengambilan gambar. Baik, eh, hadirin yang berbahagia, tibalah kita di penghujung acara. Kami mengundang Ketua Panitia Seminar Ibu Dr. Lulu Laila Amalia untuk memberikan kata penutup. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the last item of the conference agenda and we would like to kindly invite Dr. Lulu Laila Amalia as the conference chair to deliver her closing remark. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Dela and Pak Rudi. Uh, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the best presenters and also the best uh, participants. Ibu Rahmawati, Pak Tubagus, uh, Ibu Gwi Diwayani, Ibu Sarah Aisha, and then also um, uh, the, the best um, participants, yeah. Uh, the honorable, okay, let me um, start the closing remarks. The honorable dean of FPBS or faculty of uh, language and literature education, Professor Dr. Tri Indri Hardini and the honorable vice deans of FPBS, distinguished guests, uh, conference participants and presenters, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon and assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay. Assalamualaikum okay. On behalf of the committee, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to Ecolite 5, the annual conference held by Faculty of Language and Literature Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. As we know that this year's theme is digital literacy and, and autonomy, current trends and practices in education, culture, and literature studies. It is an honorable opportunity to hold a conference, which is attended by hundreds of researchers, teachers, and practitioners, also policymakers. In this pandemic, I am certain that we face limitation to adapt with the current situation. Therefore, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Rector of UPI, the Dean of FPBS, and the Vice Deans of FPBS for their remarkable supports. I would also uh, Thank our sincere keynote speakers, Professor Dr. Nandan Sleen, our Nawati MPD. And Professor Douglas K. Hartman for uh, their willingness to share their knowledge and experiences to, uh, to offer solutions to the challenges of our time. High appreciation is especially addressed to the fellow committees who have shown ideas, energy, and commitment to hold this conference. It was not an easy task, okay? It was not an easy task, we know that. Yet, we made it all, alhamdulillah. Last but not least, please accept our immense gratitude 
to all of you who have attended the sessions that the committee has planned to accommodate your choice and interests. All in all, on behalf of the organizing committee of the fifth Ecolite International Conference, I would like to express apology for inconveniences that you will probably experience before, during, and after the conference. Thank you very much and see you again next year for Ecolite 6. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Ibu Lulu. Hadirin yang kami banggakan, kata penutup dari Ketua Panitia menjadi penanda berakhirnya seluruh rangkaian acara seminar pada hari ini. Kami sampaikan penghargaan yang setinggi-tingginya kepada seluruh pembicara, pemakalah, peserta, dan tak lupa seluruh tim kepanitiaan. Terima kasih atas partisipasi hadirin semua. Semoga kita dapat bertemu lagi pada seminar berikutnya. Tetap jaga kesehatan. Terima kasih. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the conference chair's closing speech marks the end of the conference. Our sincere gratitude is addressed to the honorable speakers, guests, participants, and the organizing committee. Thank you for participating in this conference. Hopefully, we will see you again in the next conference. We wish you safe and healthy. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Ada informasi tambahan? Mohon dapat uh, uh, menyimak sejenak informasi tambahan. Mengingatkan kembali bagi hadirin yang belum mengisi formulir keikutsertaan dan evaluasi secara daring untuk mendapatkan sertifikat, silakan dapat diisi melalui tautan formulir yang sudah dibagikan di ruang obrolan. Silakan sambil mengisi, mungkin kami ingatkan kembali kepada para pemakalah mohon untuk mengunggah artikel melalui sistem dengan mengikuti titik mangsa sebagai berikut. Batas akhir pengunggahan makalah lengkap 19 Agustus 2021. Batas akhir pembayaran biaya publikasi 19 Agustus 2021. Pengumuman hasil review makalah 30 Agustus 2021. Batas akhir pengunggahan makalah yang telah diperbaiki 10 September 2021. Artikel yang memenuhi syarat akan dimuat dalam proseding internasional yang dipublikasikan oleh Atlantis Press dan di bawah penerbit Springer Nature. Sorry, sorry, can I have a questions? Budela, you are still muted. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hello, Miss. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I, to all presenters, uh, would you like to ask something? Yeah. Yeah, Miss. Uh, I yes. just want to okay. Please. Something I, okay. So, Michael, Miss, and also everyone. Uh, actually, I just want to confirm how that, uh, for example, on the timetable before the one, that the I collect share. So, uh, the name of the order is only me. But actually, I have another names, and I already put into the system. But uh, till now, it's not working. So, I only can find one name. But 
there are no names. So how that we can uh, solve this problem then? Thank you. Okay, so from the committee, perhaps, we can help Ibu Vidayani for the question. I, I couldn't hear it clearly just now. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, could you please repeat Ibu Gui? Yeah, uh, thank you. Actually, I put into the system uh, three orders, including me, but in fact, I only find one order. So I can see uh, the order only on the timetable, but when I check the Google Scholar, so already three names, but it will be affected or not later on the paper because I have to make three names over there. Thank you. Okay, there are all, there's only one name instead yeah. of three authors. Okay, listed. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, is so it for for uh, last year's uh, publication or this year's publication? Or no, this for year's? now. For now. For I'm doing currently. Yeah. Okay. But uh, all right. So basically, there are three authors in your paper. Yes. Correct. Yes. But you can only find one author in the system. Yeah. Or in the program. Uh, in the timetable that you shared yesterday, when there is my name and then my room, that's nice. only one name. When I see my friends, they have two or three speakers there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, please accept our apology. Later, we will uh, revise. Okay. Yeah. Uh, later, we will revise. But then, if it is any um, effect on the publication or on the paper, I will... Um, uh, send this to, or I will give the opportunity to Ibu Nuria to answer the question. All right. Yeah, I have uh, one question. Is it okay to ask? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, dan mm -hmm. di dalam abstrak begitu dan akan terekam di dalam timetable begitu. Tapi eh, eh, kalau sekarang memang sudah kalau ibu bisa menambahkan di dalam sistem eh, kami berterima kasih. Tapi mungkin ibu bisa juga memberikan nama-nama yang ibu inginkan untuk dimasukkan agar kami dapat merevisi di dalam timetable yang sudah dibuat. Uh, jadi saya udah harus uh, di di sistem kan saya udah tambah add orders itu ya okay. udah saya tambah dua tapi okay. tadi di timetable yang di share tadi malam itu kok hanya satu nama okay. tapi kalau misalnya memang is really uh, not affected so no problem for me so yeah. as long as I can put the three orders there. Okay, uh, the most important is your paper. Uh, so no, right. please make sure that uh, you put your authors in your paper. So uh, they will, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yes, I do understand. Thank okay. you. All okay. right. Thank you. Uh, may I have a question? I have one. Uh, may I, I have a question? Oh, sorry. Pak Suhariyadi. This is from Pak Suhariyadi. Um, I have two uh, presentations today. Uh, so I become two uh, presenters, so with different titles. My question is very simple. So uh, do, do I need to uh, submit two links for the certificate or just one link, one word submission? Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Suharyadi. Hello, it's nice to see you uh, virtually, Pak Suharyadi. Yes, thank I you so you much. Okay, <laughs> my name is Lulu. I think we met in UM. Oh, yeah, ago. oh, yeah, Ibu, sorry. <laughs> so thank <laughs> you so okay, much. Pa. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, for the exit ticket, actually, even though you are representing uh, two papers, the certificate will still be issued for one name, if it is the same names. Mm -hmm. So if you submit two papers, uh, you will still only have one certificate as a presenter. Okay. Yes. So there is no uh, title in the certificate? Uh, no. Unfortunately, not yet for this year. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Ibu. Thank you so much for joining our conference, Pak Suharyadi. You are welcome. Ibu Lulu, mungkin ini ada pertanyaan lagi yang muncul di chat ya. Untuk nama yang tertera pada daftar hadir dan exit ticket juga harus mengisi nama rekan. Sayakah atau cukup 
satu presenter saja yang mengikuti seminar hari ini. Bagaimana Bu Lulu? Ada pertanyaan dari presenter room satu. Uh -huh. uh, untuk nama yang tertera pada daftar hadir dan oh, exit iya. ticket juga harus mengisi nama rekan saya kah atau cukup saya saja yang mengikuti seminar hari ini? Jadi gimana? Ya, uh, sebetulnya memang sertifikat itu diberikan kepada tiga presenter uh -huh. yang ada di dalam nama itu ya. Jadi kalaupun misalnya memang hari ini yang dua tidak sempat misalnya mengisi exit tiket, nanti bisa disampaikan ke bagian uh, sekretariat melalui email Ecolite. Hmm. Uh, informasinya seperti apa. Nah, seperti Bapak Ibu ketahui bahwa uh, sertifikat itu akan kita publish maksimal 14 hari kerja setelah Ecolite uh, selesai. Uh, itu maksimalnya. Jadi jika sebelum itu kami sudah bisa menyelesaikan uh, semua sertifikat bisa diakses di Google Drive, gitu. Oke, okay. terima kasih Bu Lulu. Pertanyaannya Ibu Astari sudah terjawab ya? Iya. Baik, berarti untuk uh, alamat emailnya cukup ke alamat email presenter satu saja, berarti ya Bu ya? Kalau untuk alamat email itu kan memang nanti diberikan uh, seperti broadcast juga uh, untuk pengaksesan Google Drive-nya diberikan kepada kalau misalnya yang outer 1 dan 2 mendaftar lewat sistem itu pasti akan uh, mendapatkan broadcast yang sama, Bu. Baik, baik. Terima kasih, Ibu. Oke. Okay. Boleh, boleh bertanya satu hal lagi saya Ibu Rita. Uh, tadi saya tidak sempat untuk screenshot uh, harus menghubungi siapa begitu boleh. <laughs> Terima kasih. You are one of the best participants, right, Ibu? Oh iya, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Ibu. Oke. Okay. Uh, Ibu, uh, one, one of our colleague probably would like to share the screen again uh, so that we can see to whom the best presenters and uh, participants should contact. Yeah. Sudah dibagikan juga mungkin oleh Ibu Suci di room chat. Uh, salah satu rekan panitia kami menampilkan, menyebarkan di, eh, menyebarkan, menyampaikan di, menyampaikan di chat di ruang bincang. Uh, baik, mohon maaf. Uh, ini izin menjawab pertanyaan dari Bu Amalia yang tentang I have a question, where should I upload the, the payment proof of the publication fee? Uh, bisa dikirimnya ke email Ecolite saja, Bu. Kalau misalnya yang sudah disatukan dan sudah diupload di sistem, itu baik. Jadi kami akan mengambil data dari sistem dari akun Bapak-Ibu. Tapi bila yang belum, silakan dikirim ke ecolite.up.edu. Begitu, nanti akan kami sisir datanya dari sana. Hello, sorry, may I ask a question? Okay. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, okay, so uh, I try to, what is it? Uh, my full name is an isn't state enough in in the timetable, something like that. So my name is Rifdan Hidayati, but there is only Rifda Hidayati. So it will affect, will it affect the certificate that I'll receive? Oh, uh, once you have already uh, completed the exit ticket, Ibu, uh -huh. yeah, I think mm -hmm. when you uh, filled in or when you completed the exit ticket, uh, we we uh, we also ask you to. Uh, put your name and your complete name for the certificate, correct? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are going to take that data for the okay. certificate of the, uh, okay. issues, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much for the information. Yeah, okay. I think it's already five, uh, 3.30, yeah, Ibu. Almost 3.30, Ibu Dela and Parudi. Uh, I think we should uh, close the whole session. Uh, it's a wrap, but probably we should take a picture first. Um, Yes, for the remaining session, uh, for the remaining time, if uh, all the presenters and uh, the dean, we still have the dean here, Ibu Dini, could you please uh, switch on the camera? 
and Ibu Juju. Uh, Ibu Juju, please bisa dibuka uh, kameranya, yeah. Bapak Ibu yang masih hadir di sini. Kita take yeah. picture yeah. dulu. Ibu Lulu tapi enggak bisa muncul. Hmm. Mari, Teopi, sebarang slide. Siapa? Di room 12, Ibu Aulia mohon untuk memastikan audionya, videonya tertutup. Video Oke. Okay. Baik, di sini ada tujuh slide di laptop saya, Ibu Bapak. Uh, kita siap-siap dulu. Uh, Could you please give us the best smile if you, if it is possible? Yeah. Or you can also use the reaction uh, heart ya. Yeah. Ya, yeah. bisa menggunakan reaksi heart. Ya, yeah. Bu Novi siap? Oke, okay. slide satu. Ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. slide berikutnya. Slide yang kedua. Ya, yeah. thank you. Slide yang ketiga, reaksinya uh, berikan heart kepada kami. <laughs> Oke, okay. slide tiga, slide four. Ya, yeah. thank you. And then slide five, slide five. Uh, Pak Didin bisa diberikan heart-nya Pak Didin. Oke. Okay. Slide 5 and then slide 6. Slide 6. Iya. Yeah. Uh, slide berikutnya slide 6, slide 7 yang terakhir ini. Tidak apa-apa. Ya. Yeah. Baik. Terima kasih Ibu Bapak dan semuanya. Thank you very much for joining our conference. Stay safe, stay happy, sane and healthy everyone. Goodbye. See you again next year. Ini Collide 6. Thank you very much. Thank you. Terima kasih semuanya. Sehat -sehat Terima kasih semuanya ya. Thank you very much. Sehat selalu Bapak Ibu dan semuanya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih semuanya. Sukses.